go ahead and call the uh, this meeting, the special meeting of the Board of Curators of the University of Missouri to order. Uh, just keep in mind that we do have uh, media and other persons listening in, so uh, if you have a comment or a motion or a second, please do it into the microphone. I want to uh, point out that uh, Curator Jamie Farmer is participating by telephone, but she is, she is on board here and present by telephone. You have the agenda in front of you, and I think uh, because of the absence of one curator who is on his way, we'll move to the second agenda item, which is a report from the report and proposal from the Compensation and Human Resources Committee. And uh, Chairman Lehman, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Compensation and HR Committee has one action item today and that is the appointment revision for Interim Chancellor Christopher Maples at Missouri S&T. President Choi, if you want to make some comments, please. I, I will. Interim Chancellor Maples was appointed in May of this year to serve a one-year term as uh, Interim Chancellor at Missouri S&T following the departure of Dr. Cheryl Schrader. And as part of that agreement, uh, we have a contract with a salary of $275,000, as well as a vehicle allowance of $12,000, and the use of the chancellor's home. Uh, you may recall that in the past that the university was providing approximately $30,000 for a housing allowance for the chancellor to live off campus. We decided together as a group that it would be appropriate for the chancellor to live in the chancellor's home. <laughs> let me, it's just feedback. Um, let me, and as part of that agreement, we all agreed to appoint uh, Chancellor Maples for one year. Uh, as you know, Chancellor Maple has done an outstanding job during his first six months in office. He has brought the community back to create a very collegial and inclusive community. He has focused on growing the research. He has also hired the, an excellent Dean of Engineering and Richard Wilson, and, uh, and is continuing to make uh, important progress for the three critical mission that we have, missions that we have, including student success, research breakthroughs, and effective engagement. So I would like to request that the board consider approving a one-year extension of his term at the same compensation level uh, to be completed in June of 2019. And I want to go back and talk a little bit about the vehicle allowance. As, as you may know, following the auditor's report and our analysis of best practices, we decided as a group working with the board to phase out vehicle allowances. And in the future, vehicle allowances will be provided only for the president and the chancellors moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, President Choi. Does anybody else have any questions? I appreciate you um, hitting those items because that's something that I think, you know, as you mentioned, we talked about extensively, and I appreciate you making those changes. If there's no further discussion, may I please have a motion and a second from the Compensation and HR Committee to recommend to the board approval for the appointment revision of interim chancellor Christopher Maples. So moved. Second. Cindy, could you please call roll? Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sunbolt? Yes. Okay. You have all committee votes in favor? Mr. Chairman, I move the full board to appoint uh, to approve the appointment revision for interim chancellor Christopher Maples. We have a motion. Uh, do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second if there are no questions or comments. Cindy, will you call the roll on the motion? Curator Bernsick? Yes. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sundle? Yes. Okay. Motion carried. I think it'd be appropriate this time to, to recognize uh, Chancellor Maples. Chris, would you stand and be recognized? And
Happy to have you with us uh, that, that additional year, and thank you for all you're doing down at s &T. Next, I would uh, call up on David Steelman, chair of the Finance Committee for the uh, business before the, the important business before the board today uh, from the Finance Committee. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all members of the Finance Committee are now present, Curator Snowden. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Curator Farmer is uh, on the phone with us to make it uh, all members are present because we have an important uh, uh, item before the board. I, let me say this before I introduce uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Rapp, who's going to go through this a little bit more. Uh, this is what we're doing today <coughs> new. Uh, we, we are trying to change both the uh, uh, way in which we handle capital improvements to become more strategic and to get more bar board involvement at an early uh, time. There's been some confusion in talking to the, to the different members of the board exactly what we're doing. Uh, so, Ryan, should I introduce you or Dr. Choi first? Okay. Uh, we're going to begin with a statement from Dr. Choi on how he views this and the process and what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair, uh, Curator Steelman. Um, as uh, Curator mentioned, in September, the Board of Curators approved a process to replace the existing capital planning process as we prepare, prepare for fiscal year 2019. This process will ensure that the Board of Curators has input early at the uh, stage of capital planning, which is very important to ensure that our campuses are operating with the objectives of growing the three missions of the university and provides long-term strategy and also sound financial planning this morning, you will hear from each campus chancellor, as well as Jonathan Curtright, the CEO of MU Healthcare. They will outline their five-year plan. And as part of this uh, process, we're also going to be recommending to the Board of Curators our highest capital project, which is the translation, translational precision medical complex, which is critical for our AAU standing at the Columbia campus and will enable close synergies and collaborations across the four campuses to enable our faculty and students to compete for federal research grants that can be translated into valuable products and processes for the marketplace. So with that, let me now turn it over to Mr. Ryan Rapp. If I might say first, the, one of the really important items that the President just addressed is setting a uh, university-wide, all four campus-wide, priority, which the Board of Curators has traditionally shied away from because it, it is a hard decision and these decisions have to be uh, made. And, and so I think we need to recognize that that motion will be made at some time. <coughs> uh, Ryan, you're now going to provide kind of a brief overview again on what we're doing today, right? Correct. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you a brief overview, uh, remind everyone of what we discussed in September, and, and then I'll turn it over to Chancellor Cartwright to st start the process. I, I want to remind everyone where we're at. This is the new process that was approved in September, and I think we all agreed that capital um, is a strategic area for the board to be focused, and really it ought to be our strategy that drives our financial plan and our capital planning. At the same time, we talked about a gated approach to capital, and I want to remind everyone we're at gate A, which, which I kind of describe as being at the top of the funnel. Um, so it's really, here are the projects that each campus is considering moving forward with. I think the key questions today are, how do these projects tie with the strategy? Um, as far as the details around the funding and all of, all of those items, those will be things that we're working on between now in March when we come back to the board and say, based on the input that we've heard from the board, um, the, 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 this is the system prioritized list that comes forward in March. So that'll come back to the board, and that would be the gate B approval um, for, for projects. That'll come to the Finance Committee in March, and then we'll bring it to the full board for approval at the April meeting. Um, so I guess before we begin, I, I think the goal today would be if, if the board had input on reordering priorities, if they had questions that they wanted that you wanted to make sure were answered when we bring back the system prioritized list in March for projects. Um, 
or if there's concerns that you want addressed when we come back in March, now would be the time to make that clear to us. Um, with that, I'd ask if there's any questions about the process before we get started. Um, any questions or discussion? Because this this is the this is our first time out of the uh, gate on on a new process, and so if there's questions or comments, we can. This is not set in stone. This is this is not just a choreographed uh, uh, presentation. If, if changes that you want to make or questions you want to ask or or opinions or recommendations, feel free at any time. But right now would be a good time if you have them. <clears throat> I have some thoughts, but I think they'll come up as you get into the process more. And, and just uh, one last item. If we had a couple of projects that we, so keep in mind to Curator Steelman's point, this is our first time through this. It's a new process. We also have some FY18 projects, and we've marked those in the mailing materials of considering an FY18 start. If it's considered for FY18, we've been clear that while it's going to go through gate A approval, it would go straight to gate C, that we're not going to bring it back as part of the five-year plan. So for those projects uh, that are, it's marked in your materials, we would expect to bring that, the next step would be to bring that forward for the board uh, for project approval. Uh, any additional questions? Any questions or comments? Okay. All right. Not all. I'll turn it over to Chancellor Cartwright. Ryan, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, Chancellor uh, Cartwright will present the uh, MU uh, Mizzou preliminary five-year capital plan. Good morning. Uh, members of the board, President Choi, fellow chancellors and colleagues who are here today, it really is a pleasure for me to present our preliminary capital plan uh, for the University of Missouri uh, Columbia campus. Uh, as you can see on the slide, we have identified and ranked five projects for consideration before you today. I will briefly talk about each one of them, uh, and then we will go into even greater detail with the translational precision medicine complex, <coughs> which is our highest priority. Simply put, the TPMC will put Mizzou and Missouri on the map as a national and international leader in medical and research practice and become a centerpiece for the future of biomedical research at MU. It will bring together key areas including the School of Medicine, College of Engineering, College of Veterinary Medicine, and expertise in the animal sciences we have with the College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources. This facility will enable us to conduct leading edge research, enhance recruitment and retention of the most talented researchers, and maximize opportunities for external grant funding. In addition, we see this as a statewide resource that will empower biomedical research throughout Missouri. What does it mean to the typical Missourian? It means we will be at the front edge of what is becoming known as precision medicine, an emerging approach to disease treatment and prevention that accounts for individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle, which promises medical outcomes barely imaginable today. This facility also offers exciting public-private partnership potential with the Harry S. Truman Memorial Veterans Hospital and MU. It would become a place that specializes in research and treatment of many of the health issues facing our veterans in Missouri and beyond. At Missouri's public, as Missouri's public AAU research institution, such a facility would greatly enhance our standing among the nation's top research universities and strengthen our position nationally as we compete for faculty, research dollars, and centers. This is underscored by the fact that the National Institutes of Health has identified translational medicine research as a major focus of grant funding in the near future. The initial documents you have before you indicate a project cost of $150 million, with funding coming from a combination of internal dollars, philanthropy, and support from the state and other sources. This project could be done in phases, with shelf space provided in some areas until further funding is identified. The total project could be accomplished with $200 million in funds. The TPMC would be constructed just south of the Gateway Residence Hall, east of the University Hospital and Clinics uh, facility. Our second campus priority is the renovation and addition of our existing facility for the Sinclair School of Nursing. We would construct a three-story addition to the building that would provide enhanced simulation labs, research labs, and collaborative space for students. 
It also includes renovation of the existing, existing building to improve functionality and accessibility. The current facility is not adequate for the top ranked nursing program we have at Mizzou. Many of our faculty receive significant research grants, but we do not have the space to accommodate the work. This facility will enhance our ability to attract grants and will further strengthen our AAU standing. This project would require $20 million in funds. Our next pro uh, ranked project is an upgrade and maintenance of the research vivarium in the Medical Sciences Building. Our current vivarium was built in 1954 and is outdated by today's standards for animal care and research. These facilities limit our research growth potential in the School of Medicine and throughout the campus. The project involves, involves $13.1 million in renovation funding and could support our efforts to strengthen our AAU standing. You will hear AAU quite a bit in what we're doing. Uh, our fourth project is an addition to the library depository in the east part of town <coughs> to consolidate mass storage collections and university archives collections into one location. The new facility would include high bay storage systems and climate control. Currently, many of these collections are held in temporary storage facilities, including one that suffered air conditioning failure this summer, requiring tarps to be placed over the books to protect them from dripping water. This is a $5.2 million project. Our final ranked project is the new journalism building, which would be constructed on the current site of Neff Hall Annex. This $45 million facility will bring together MU Media brands of KOMU, KBIA, Missourian, and Vox to create a multi-platform class lab environment as well as other programs such as strategic communications, documentary journalism, and leadership. This location also <laughs> provides an excellent space for a new MU Welcome Center that would serve to bridge the community and the campus. Earlier this year, we announced a gift from the David Novak Foundation that provided $21.6 million for the Novak Leadership Institute. We envision that the institute will be housed in the new facility as well. So these are the five ranked priority projects for the University of Missouri. We will f need to continue discussions with the board and system leadership, but several of these projects we anticipate we could seek appro project approval in late spring or early summer of 2018. I am happy to take any questions at this time about any of these projects, and I do have several leaders here uh, today who can help me answer any specific qu questions you may have about uh, any of these projects. Okay, any questions or discussion? Uh, Curator Chapman. Um, thank you, Dr. Cartwright. Yes. This, this question is probably better for Ryan, you know, to just back up yeah. a little bit. Um, but last summer, we approved four projects to send to the legislature. Now, as we go through this process, I think we're going to probably hear about 20 projects today. In the end, how many projects are we going to be? Is this, is, this a, um, is this process designed to submit a certain number of projects to the legislature for requested funding? Or um, so, just tell me how that's going to yeah, work in the end. So uh, this spring in March, we'll, we'll come back with how we want to go about funding this. Uh, we would anticipate then the Finance Committee would move that forward for approval to the full board in April. Along with approving the five-year plan, it would approve the state request for capital funding. So, so we would do that at the March meeting okay. on, uh, and, and, and wouldn't be in a position of where the board would be surprised by what we're asking the state for. So I guess my, just to follow up on that, so we're going to hear about 20 projects or so today. How many in the end are we going to end up uh, moving forward with? Is it going to be five? Is it going to be 10? Or is there a certain dollar figure associated with what we're going to be moving forward with? Uh, so we're limited to one per campus with, with the state, and it has to be related to our educational and research buildings. So four would be the most that we could submit to a state, okay. to the state in a given year. And I think some of that would be informed uh, by the possibility of us, wh what do we think the probability of getting a project funded is? But I'd also remind the board that there's been many years where we've put project requests forward and they never become funded. Um, but I think in the years where we've gotten funded, we haven't always expected it. So I think it is always important that we make a request. Okay. But uh, four is the most that we could request. Okay. May I just add, and Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, 
When you say that is the most, it is very possible that we will submit fewer uh, than that. That will be a board decision. Correct. Are we, are we talking about those on which we seek state funding? Because there are a number of projects here, including some on the MU campus, where we're not seeking state funding. Ryan, you want to address? I can address too, but I want. Yes, yes, that's what we're. We're talking about projects that are seeking state funding. I, I think once we know what our pri the priorities are, then we'll think about where do, where do we want to ask the state for support and, and where does it make sense. And also keep in mind these will go out over five years. So um, you, you may be looking to the state in some out years, but, but we will drive out what we're actually going to submit to the state each year through this process. So I, I'd like to commend uh, the, whoever put this together uh, I think you did it in a really simple fashion, which is really good. Uh, and the one page thinking front and back, uh, it's not all apparently going to be shown on the screen. So when <clears throat> the public looks at this and it, take the second one for example, and it says the project cost for the nursing building is going to be uh, $20 million, it doesn't really get into the, uh, uh, it <clears throat> I think we need to make sure that as we talk about it, we recognize where the funding comes from. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, I think that will give us a little bit of, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, enthusiasm. Because if, if this, this board has concluded that we shouldn't be looking to the state for funding for all of our projects, and that ain't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, the first comment I have for the day is, uh, really nicely done in terms of presentation and ease of understanding. Uh, as we get into the ranking, you did some finite uh, percentage weights and so forth. Um, more difficult for us to grasp that without background. And I'm not sure that as long as we're not being bound by those rankings, um, not a problem. But these kinds of things can't be pigeonholed by, by a calculation, I don't think. So that's why we're here. No. And again, I, and first of all, Ryan uh, and his team, I, don't wanna, I can't even name all the teams, so I don't want to leave anybody out, and Rick Banyak, who I, I think sometimes folks don't realize have been how active he's been, have, have really spearheaded this process. Uh, I, I would like to address one thing. I think it is important as we go through this to recognize the importance of priorities, and we're going to talk particularly uh, about Dr. Choi's recommendation on the TPMC, but it is also important to understand that these priorities can change depending on whether financing develops or not. At this level, what we're trying to do is establish so that development has to follow our strategy, the board's strategy. So we want to be fairly generous letting, in my opinion, that's just my opinion, letting projects into the funnel because if till they're in the funnel, uh, development officers can't even test their viability. But as it goes through the funnel, if there is donor support for one project and, and not for another, then we may reevaluate priorities. Uh, can I ask a quick question? A little bit to do with what David said and also what John said. I think this is probably for you, Ryan. Uh, just so I'm crystal clear, we're evaluating these on our priorities and then we're going to figure out, is there state money, is there donor money, is there our money, is there, right? So the y yes. first thing is, what's the most important project? Yes. That's, okay. Exactly. I just want to make sure that we, was what, what you will see in March <coughs> is we'll come back with, here is the system priorities, here's the funding plan on how we think we'll actually execute on this. This is really just, we don't want to go do all of that, and you guys say, wait a minute, we don't think these are priorities. Right, and so we have a, one, one if you don't mind, Julie. So then we have, this is the most important project for the University of Missouri, for Mizzou, and then here's how it relates to the, you know, the total <coughs> University of Missouri. And um, we need to figure out how to pay for it. Okay, thank you. So I think one of the questions then for the board, maybe an easy one, is there a priority that's not on this list that you think should be? Oh, that, that would be a very valid question, yes. Or do you have any reason to disagree with the priorities on here? Uh, as we go through, I have a disagreement with one priority, for example. But that'll, that'll, 
just kind of setting the stage, because I don't think we're here to approve any specific project for funding or anything else, right? We're talking about a process by which we will get to approving the dollars and cents, but do we all agree that these are the priorities? And if not, why not? If so, great. Exactly, and I think, and we, it may change because it'll, it'll depend on what the entire board wants to do, but I think at least setting priorities right now, understanding they're flexible are, imp are important. Any, it, well, I will have some if no one else does, of course, but any more questions for, for uh, Chancellor Cartwright? I, I have a, a number, but uh, I don't want to dominate, so other people. I have the same problem, John, but one of us is going to have to yield to the temptation. I'll go first. <laughs> go ahead, Daryl. So, Dr. Cartwright, <coughs> in coming to, you know, your final list of projects, how many projects did you evaluate when you, um, um, how many projects total were submitted for evaluation before you came down to this, this group of projects? Um, I'll ask Gary to verify exactly, but there was somewhere between 15 to 20 that we looked at. <coughs> I don't remember the exact number, but it was in that order that we looked at and ended up with these five. I've got a more, uh, told to talk a little louder. Um, I've got a more holistic question sort of for all four campuses, which is really what goes into this 30% weighted program plan. Um, and I would just like a little bit more explanation about what that means and what types of criteria are evaluated, what variables are looked at in determining what the program plan scoring is. Um, on that one, I'm going to have to ask Gary to actually answer that for me. Gary, can you talk about the 30 percent, the scoring? So it takes a look at each program based upon the academic and research needs of that particular building. That's one way to criteria. The needs, the needs of the building, or does that tie to an overall strategic plan in terms of what uh, each campus um, strengths and uh, academic reputations are and, right. and growth in those areas? Right. Like, like all these projects went through that process because of the, the biomedical uh, uh, opportunities we have through our nursing in the same way with, well, the, the med science vivarium has been in the, in the works for several years based upon that. And then the, uh, the J school went through that same thing because of the reputation of that. More questions. So um, I, I think we've agreed, uh, I think unanimously, that the, that the Translational Precision Medicine Complex, TPMC, I hope I can get used to that acronym, uh, is the top priority of the university as well as uh, the MU campus. Uh, I just wanted to, to make the point that I think that we, uh, I personally, and I hope that the board gives a fair amount of uh, attention to the opportunities for collaboration. And, and this is maybe maybe the most key, certainly it's the, since it's the most important for the university, uh, that there, uh, when we think of this as a campus project, I think of it, you don't like the word, but I'm gonna say <laughs> system project, uh, because it, it is an opportunity for uh, inter-campus collaboration. That, that, that's one of the uh, great things about this project. Uh, I would note that <coughs> this had been proposed um, within the campus in Kansas City four years ago, uh, originally as a tax-supported uh, uh, project that the, the university would have been one of uh, a few institutions, um, and then without the tax support because there's so much of this kind of work going on in Kansas City and with the, uh, with the uh, not-for-profits surrounding our campus there. And so I'm, you know, I've been excited about this. I'm just as happy that it's on the MU campus because it doesn't matter what campus it's on. It is a university opportunity and I hope we make the most of it. I don't have any issues about the other prioritizations um, each one, the way it was presented to us, uh, has project funding, which is kind of um, loosey-goosey, <coughs> so just our best guess as we sit here. Right. Um, and 
um, as we get into it, I, I guess I, are we, when will we, are we just delaying the discussion of how it's going to get funded? Because on this project, I thought it was going to be like 200 or 250 million, and it will be staged. Um, and I thought that we might be using um, bonding on it, but it doesn't appear that we are. Maybe today's not the day to <coughs> Chancellor Cole. No, we can talk about that. Chancellor. Well, yeah, for all of these, uh, my understanding of what we were presenting today was for gate A, which is here's the project, here's roughly what the budget looks like. We will come back to you with a few of these, a couple of these in the spring that have very specific details of exactly what you're asking. Here's how it's going to be funded. Here's where the money's coming from. Here's the plan of when it's going to be uh, implemented and, and the timeline. All of that will be in the next gate, right, Ryan? That was the, that's what we were asked to do. <laughs> so the fact Actually, that if I could add, so is it $150 Because I was thinking, like John, I was thinking I remembered it was a little higher. Yeah. It was $200 million when we said the whole project is $200 million. Yeah. What we're thinking about is, is phasing it in. Uh, the first phase could be about $100 million, and then we can add on as we go. How much is the TPMC total, though? $200 million is what we're looking okay. at for everything. That would be there. And so when our, our executive summary page shows internal 50, uh, gifts uh, 50, and state 50, that could change in the spring. That could change once we do a little more due diligence. And it shows no bonds. Right. right. At this time, it does well, not it, show it, that. But can I speak to that just yes, a little please. bit? And again, I'm just one curator. I'm telling you how I kind of view this. I, I anticipate a motion being made. Uh, and, and I hope that the Finance Committee passes it and the Board passes it today that the TPMC is our top priority, which I hope will also allow us to at least uh, talk to the Legislature and the Governor's Office about it, but to me is also a commitment that we are going to build this. I will tell you that I personally believe if there is a shortfall that we should consider bonding at that time. And that, but that is just my belief. That will have to come to the committee. Uh, bonding is sometimes controversial. I'm just telling you, my belief is if there's a shortfall, we will make it up. Okay. Doc, Dr. Cartwright, yes. another question. Um, you had mentioned that you guys will be pursuing public-private partnerships um, with the TPMC. Have any been identified yet? Do we have any commitments? Um, where are we at in that process? We We've already had uh, several people who are interested in it. I'd ask uh, uh, Elizabeth Leboa uh, to give specifics on all. Do, do you want to mention all the different, a number of them at least as examples? Yeah, I'm happy to. I think uh, the first thing we want to highlight, and I don't know if there was the opportunity yet in the documents you have, is of course David Isaacs, the director of the VA hospital, is very interested in having the VA hospital researchers in this facility and is actively looking to raise $50 million federally and has engaged uh, Claire McCaskill and was also in work with uh, Blunt's office. So that's when we talked about from the public-private partnership, the VA looks at uh, anything outside federal yeah. as being a private. So they're looking at us as part of a, a private for that public-private partnership. In addition, I, I just got off the phone with uh, my strategic advisory board, um, which uh, my, my group has talked about how they want to actively fundraise $10 million themselves to, to bring to the table for, from the College of Engineering side. But then we also named uh, incredible opportunities that could and should be pursued with Cerner, uh, given that they're here, uh, Bayer now merging with Monsanto, some of the more pharmaco uh, backgrounds. Uh, we're talking now about reaching out to Genentech and a multitude of others from the industry standpoint. So I think all of us as deans have, have been getting coming together and bringing those partnerships forward. Of course, uh, Dr. McIntosh is Vice Chancellor for Research. Um, I know we have more meetings coming next week uh, related to some more of those public-private partnerships. Great. Thank you. I'm going to have questions if no one else does. Sure. I do want to talk a little bit about TPMC in a little more detail. Well, that, and that's, I, I'd like at first, because I think what Curator Phillips brought up, you and I had discussed, which is a critical part of the fact that while this is part of the MU uh, uh, campus and part of your uh, preliminary capital plan, this is really a statewide project across multiple campuses. And that part of, <coughs> at least my thinking as a curator, is that 
I would like to hear from you as to how we intend to drive that, why that's going to lead to collaboration, what do we have to do to get more collaboration, because I think if, if we make this motion today, which I anticipate to make this our absolute top priority and commit ourselves to building this, that it's important for you to speak to what this means to each area of the state and each campus, including, by the way, the uh, medical school in Springfield. Yes, okay. Uh, so uh, what I'll do is I'll go over first the TPMC and then I'll come back to that if you're okay with that. Um, so uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, of course, that the TPMC is our top priority. Um, we believe it will be transformative uh, for us. Uh, I will discuss it in more detail, uh, but I'd like to show first a brief video about the excitement of this facility. In Columbia, the University of Missouri provides global leadership through a world-class education in medicine, animal science, engineering, business, law, education, and liberal arts, all from a single campus. Now, as the world draws even closer together, it's time to find strengths in our differences and converge, to collaborate, to integrate, to innovate, and to change the world. Bringing these aspirations to life the Translational Precision Medicine Complex, where researchers and clinicians work together to create the next generation of biomedical solutions. Great minds in engineering, medicine, and vet science share spaces where new ideas collide and can join. This nucleus of knowledge pulls in research resources from around the world, and the most promising ideas advance from concept to pilot-scale manufacturing. From benchtop to bedside, all from inside the TPMC. So, um, it, you'll see that, you know, just as an overview, uh, it talks about the unique strengths in medicine, engineering, veterinary medicine, the collisions that'll happen, animal scientists that all come together uh, in this facility. Uh, precision medicine is the future, and, and the customized care delivery approach to the individual patient is not currently in use for most diseases, but will certainly revolutionize medical treatment in our lifetime. This facility will put Missouri at the forefront of precision medicine and help us to produce the Mizzou-made engineers and clinicians uniquely equipped with the skills to succeed in this new frontier of healthcare. Research discoveries would have the potential to lead to new companies and eventually to high-paying job creation for the state. Missouri residents would stand to reap the advanced healthcare benefits by having access to highly trained professionals in the field. And this facility will be a resource for institutions across the state, from universities to hospitals, including, as Curator Steelman said, uh, all four campuses in the UM system. The TPMC opens the door to robust collaborative opportunities and discoveries in precision medicine and related areas. The opportunity to incorporate research and treatment space that is important to veterans is an additional plus. A core mission of the Department of Veterans Affairs is to improve the lives of veterans and all Americans through healthcare discovery and innovation. VA funded research has led to breakthroughs in treating cancer and heart disease, developing new diagnostic tools such as a CT scan and implantable cardiac pacemaker. The TPMC provides an opportunity to bring these researchers together with MU scientists and clinicians to make new discoveries and deliver care. Finally, it is important to realize and emphasize, again, the significance of this facility improvement to our standing with our AAU peers. This building will increase our laboratory space and research core areas, attract additional researchers, and enable us to compete much more successfully for research grants. It will play a crucial role in MU's future success. Again, for this project, we will bring back the final plan for approval in the spring after we've had further discussions with the board and system leadership. I want to now address uh, Curator Steelman's uh, question about uh, how do we use this as a collaborative, uh, 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 collaborative uh, facility across the state. Um, if you look at what is happening in big science, most things that are happening now are at the collision areas. They're what we call boundary science. Uh, and it requires people who have skills from multiple uh, areas. And the easiest way to really make a big impact is with those really um, uh, big science concepts. But big science also requires big facilities. 
and those end up being significantly uh, significant uh, cost associated with creating such a facility. An institution like the University of Missouri needs to be thinking about how do we invest uh, in research areas and create the way that I like to think about these is centers of excellence that are located at one, uh, maybe one physical location, but that are accessible by all of the related campuses. This allows us then to share that cost across multiple campuses, and you could even envision other opportunities at other campuses where we would benefit, our campus, MU, would benefit from access to facilities at other campuses. We've seen this in educational programs already. We see that we use pharmacy from uh, UMKC, uh, but now we need to think about how do we expand that even further to be able to use uh, uh, other facilities across the state. We have a tremendous relationship uh, right now with the Danforth Plant Sciences Center, which uh, serves as a model. We use their facilities. We are hiring joint faculty with them. They use our facilities, and we're two hours apart but it's, a, it's, it's really reaping some tremendous benefits. Our students are there, stu their, students, their students come here. Uh, there are many things that we could put in place, and I think this is the beginning of that transformation, <coughs> that we could be thinking about how do we enable that type of science to take place? Where would people, when they come here, where could they stay? Uh, because this is part of an impediment, but where are ways that we can do all of this that make it uh, very successful? And in terms of the Springfield campus, again, realize that this, this allows us now to start thinking about different populations around the state. And I'd probably like, before I get in too much trouble, I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, Dean uh, De La Fontaine to talk about uh, how you think about population science <coughs> and what it, population medicine and what that could do to help with the precision medicine and why Springfield and other locations would be really beneficial to the work in the TPMC. Well, thank you, uh, Chancellor Cartwright. Um, so population health is really, like precision medicine, one of the main ways uh, we're looking at advancing the health of populations. And in the same way that uh, precision medicine tries to tailor therapy more individually, taking into account genetics and proteomics and environment, uh, in the same way population health tries to take care of populations and there's individual variations uh, in populations around those, if you will, themes of genomics, environment, socioeconomic status, and other factors. And so as we think about building a health sciences uh, and biomedical research enterprise across the system, uh, studying different parts of our state at all levels becomes critical. So if we look at our Springfield campus uh, on the medical school side, uh, it is recently started, it's doing extremely well. Um, the satisfaction both at the level of the students, the residents that participate in the program, and the faculty are at all time highs. Of course, the, the funding, as you know, is challenging, uh, and we're very intent now on trying to <coughs> work with the legislature, and many folks are participating. Many of you in this room um, are participating in that, but um, we see that campus as the first step in, in, in enlarging and broadening our collaboration with Springfield. Um, going for, so we think that having students there is gonna lead to having residencies there, which the health systems there are very interested in, and then having faculty down there. And we already have faculty down there. Uh, Dr. Stannard, for instance, has established a orthopedic trauma program with Cox Health uh, that is extremely successful. And so there's many reasons, I think, why um, the TPMC can be a linchpin in that because it can be the scientific basis, if you will, for that type of collaboration where uh, we have a, a, a program uh, that cuts across all these specialties, um, going from specialists dealing with environmental problems, population health, genomics, um, physical sciences, etc. So, thank you. Just some thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to. Uh, 
I, I certainly agree with everything that uh, you've both said. Um, I think the Springfield uh, extension of the MU School of Medicine is hugely important, and I hope the legislators recognize that. Um, when I look at the proposal, um, it doesn't really talk about inter-campus uh, collaboration. So that's one thing that was left out, and it's also not in the mathematical calculations that we do. So uh, I guess I want to keep our focus on that. <clears throat> When we're talking about population health, which uh, I think is the general consensus that unless things at the federal level change, we will eventually be dealing with yeah. population health, yeah. not treating sick people. Um, yeah. And the demographics uh, in outstate Missouri are different than the demographics in St. Louis and Kansas City. Yes. So if you're going to be doing uh, precision medicine, you're going to need to access uh, the St. Louis and Kansas City campuses. Exactly. Um, now I didn't hear camp, uh, Kansas City mentioned. St. Louis has the same the same uh, opportunity for you to do that. We don't have a med school over there. They've, they've got two, and, and so uh, you know we don't have that opportunity. But I do think you have to keep it in mind, and uh, so. I'm going to be watching to see how much outreach there is for the other campuses. My first visit to Rala, I was astounded when one of our presentations <coughs> was from an engineer who had uh, uh, figured out and had, I think, gotten a patent, and I don't know whether we own it or he does, about a new way to treat burn. Um, and, and I was thinking, wow, this is being done on the Rala campus? Uh, and he was a charming, very uh, 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 erudite uh, uh, engineer who I would think would be someone that you would want to be involved in a, a, a something like this. So look for those opportunities. Uh, quit using system. Uh, David, can I? Sure. Certainly, Dr. Shoy. So this project is the highest priority for the system, and it's not due to window dressing. We're gonna be seeking those partnerships very, very carefully. Um, just a few months ago, a group of researchers from MU Health and the rest of the MU leadership visited Kansas City yeah. to meet with their colleagues at the other medical school at UMKC, an outstanding school, to discuss partnerships with MRI Global as well as the Stowers, Stowers Institute. And now what we have to do is formalize those relationships so that we can leverage the expertise that we have at the campuses for larger NIH grants and also corporate uh, donations. And the concept of working with Delbert Day at Rala, that's gonna be key. As you know, Delbert Day, in his honor, the Phelps County Hospital, I think, established the Delbert Day Cancer Center. So there's great collaboration opportunities throughout all four campuses. But we will make sure that that occurs. Any more comments or questions on the, T let's say the TPMC first, and, but, but I, I don't want anything else to get short shrift. The, the nursing uh, facility in, in particular, I think Dr. Cartwright is, it is a very important opportunity for us. Absolutely to. agree. Curator Steelman, I have a question. Um, Chancellor Cartwright, on this project and other ones, and I would ask this of all the chancellors that present if possible, um, it would be important for me for also the student input being um, addressed, if any has been taken, not only now in this stage of the capital uh, planning, but also what could be done before the next board meeting. Um, I think it's important, even though the lifespan, pardon me, <clears throat> of the student on these campuses are much shorter than these projects, building that affinity early on with having that input would be mm -hmm. a great impact. Um, so what, one of the first things that I did when I came here was to expand my cabinet to include the faculty and the students and a staff council member. Uh, so they uh, generally see a lot of the discussion of things that we are trying to do. Um, we also, even the retreat that I held last week that was really thinking about the planning for the future of Mizzou, uh, faculty, students, and staff were at that planning. Um, I, I agree completely that we need to be hearing what they think. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the decision, even uh, the, the importance that 
uh, Curator uh, Steelman mentioned of nursing, um, that is driven primarily uh, to <coughs> me because I know how many students are interested in nursing. And it became a priority and moved up the rank very quickly in a matter of a month or so, right? <laughs> right. Um, so we, we because, of, I th because I think it is so important <coughs> and there's so much uh, uh, need uh, and, and desire for students to be going into nursing that it is one of the reasons that we're trying to do that as quickly so that we can grow the class size in nursing. Um, so yes, we, I agree completely. We need to be taking into account all of the student input. Thank you. Thank you. On the School of Nursing, <coughs> Again, I'm, I'm probably jumping ahead to our spring meeting, but um, for, first of all, I think we all recognize that the School of Nursing at MU is nationally yes. ranked and recognized. So we build to our strengths, so it's important <coughs> to support this. I'm glad it's number two. Um, but on the project funding, um, I, I'm not sure how the gifts from the Sinclair and the sale of property and so forth figure in here, but isn't some of this going to be uh, coming from gifts? Yes. We've got, we've got no indication <coughs> of how we're going to do it, but it's the second most important thing on the MU campus and high on the priorities of the system. Sorry. Uh, Curator Phillips, uh, you're absolutely right. We, we do plan on doing that. And I'm going to ask uh, Dean uh, Miller to mention a little bit of this. Um, we have been thinking about that. We don't have it all worked out, but she can give you a flavor of where we're headed with how we would fund it. Well, thank you for the opportunity. We, uh, we've been thinking about this uh, issue because uh, nursing, as the other disciplines, want to serve Missourians. And there's a tremendous shortage of nursing. Nurses, there's 1.5 million are going to be short by 2020. So we really need to do something to address this and serve the citizens of Missouri. And I also want to, I'll answer that question, but I also want to let you know, you see I have the microphone. Um, <laughs> 88% or so of our graduates stay in the state of Missouri. And so as we plan for this new structure, we're going to increase our enrollments by between 30 to 40%, which means we will have between 60 and 78 more students in the clinical major, which is in the fifth semester. Now, when they come to the clinical major in our University of Missouri, we turn away two thirds of the qualified applicants because we don't have the space, we don't have the faculty as well. So this will help our revenue base as we move forward with some solid planning here. So I appreciate the chance to say hello to you, especially because this will probably be my last time. I'm going to be retiring at the end of December, so this is a, a chance for me to say goodbye as well. So the funding, we've been working on this. It has been a priority, and you've heard about nursing for uh, several board meetings uh, before this current administration. So we have been doing fundraising, and we have about $15 million that we've just been tucking away and tucking away and working really, really hard hard uh, planning for this um, a a as we move forward. So there is uh, money in the bank, so to speak, and I urge you to, uh, to continue to support us. If there's anything else in relation to fundraising. Uh. I, I would just say that not only is our School of Nursing a treasure to the university, but Dean Miller. You Dean Miller is, I agree. Oh, well, I thank agree. you. We'll <laughs> While we're still on nursing, I, I'd like to, to say that, uh, that there is another opportunity for collaboration because a lot of the nursing programs now are done distance. We have uh, uh, both in, at the MU campus and UMKC, um, and uh, it may be that there will be some opportunities, maybe it's already occurring, but more opportunities for collaboration between the nursing schools. Uh, that's just to want to get that in there. And so to just follow up on that, we have been collaborating with the other campuses in initiating our PhD program several years ago, way before I came on board. Um, the, it was initiated as a joint uh, PhD program. We can, we've grown ex exponentially with our PhD program with 56 doctoral students enrolled. But we do collaborate now more specifically with UMSL in terms of sharing courses so that, um, you know, doctoral enrollments are are very small, and so to sustain substantive enrollments, we do share some courses with uh, UMSL at this particular time. And also have done this with master's uh, courses with uh, UMKC and pediatrics, for example. 
And uh, Chancellor George, I didn't mean to leave UMSL out of that equation. I was sh shifting around in my seat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ryan, Ryan, I have a question. And it may be, when we look at priorities, and obviously we'll have one probably approved later as the highest priority, um, where you, you take the nursing project, when funding comes in and projects are smaller than the other projects, I mean, are things not pushed ahead, but if, if the nursing <coughs> building was funded, I mean, if, if, fund, if someone came in and said, hey, I've got 15 million bucks to start this thing, does that become? Th does it push it, the prioritization around? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. The, the answer is it does have an impact. Because, I mean, the projects are so different in scale. Yeah. Correct. And you look at what the school of nursing can do with that building right away. So, again, as fundraisers, who, if they're not in this room or in this room, it, it seems like that can change in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and we'll lay out a, a five-year plan, too. So, so it may be that, well, this is when we think we'll start this project. If funding, you know, if the fundraising went better than expected, that might move that right. timeline up. Right. Other question, if, if, if there was some big donor that, how do you handle big donors that have an idea, but that idea is not on our list, and do you shift them to become part of something else? So, so someone, if someone wants to give $10 million and they think we need this building, but that's not a building you need, do you shift it? <coughs> You'd still like your $10 I think million, I'm saying. This process will help uh, avoid those situations. When the fundraisers are going out meeting with donors, they, the donors would also like to hear what are the priorities of the universities, university campuses that are blessed by the president and the board of curators. Instead of going out and asking, well, what are you interested in? They'd like to hear what our plans are first. So I think that'd be, that's why this is such a good approach. If I could speak for, uh, and Phil, of course, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm going to try, and, and Ryan and, and Rick. The, the belief of the study group when we came up with this was that the very problem that you just brought up was one we need to address, that we have to be able to both run the university strategically as a board and as administration, and we also have to give some guidance to development that these are our priorities and therefore they should be raising money based on these. They should not be going out and saying, do you have money you want to spend? Can we build the building? Good idea. If, if there is no further discussion regarding uh, MU, may I have a motion and a second from the Finance Committee to approve the further planning and development of the University of Missouri-Columbia projects presented today and as uh, outlined in the board materials, and that would be uh, one three and one four, including the priorities that are set uh, as part of the MU preliminary five-year capital plan. So moved. I'll second that. Okay. Did, do we have a couple more projects to discuss for MU? No, yeah, that's just for further discussion. Okay. If there's other gotcha. discussion, I, I will. We want all discussion on these projects. Okay. Gotcha. Is there any more discussion on any MU? You have anything? Well, we only heard about nursing. We still got the. We still got a couple more. Library depository and then journalism. Okay. Did you want to address the? the <clears throat> I, I'm. I, I mentioned what we're doing with the li with the libraries. What we're doing is building the, uh, creating the offsite repository, uh, that really allows us to then move uh, books and. Uh, I could ask uh, our librarian and uh, Riley to actually talk a little bit about what that would do for our programs. Is that what you're looking for? Or? Yeah, and I, I've got a question again on the scoring because I'm gonna you're gonna hear me ask a lot of questions about the scoring. I love that we have a scoring methodology, but I need to understand a little bit more about how we're coming up with it. And a question that I'm gonna have for everybody is how does it all fit in together? So I, I understand there may be priorities on each campus, but how are we identifying which are the most important priorities for the system overall? Um, and there's a lot, I think, that um, ties into Curator Phillips' questions about the collaboration and also about um, the strengths of each campus, what's unique about them, uh, and, and more of this, um, call it tele-learning, yeah. yeah. right? And so I don't see any, I don't know how much it costs or what infrastructure. I've heard a lot of um, anecdotal 
complaints about the system technology not all tying into one another well. Um, and I don't see a, a project on here for addressing that. I don't know if the cost is simply something that doesn't rise to a level of needing a five-year capital plan. Um, but it is something that I, I don't see addressed in here. And so I'm curious, in terms of the overall scoring and how we're approaching each of these, are we doing this in the vacuum of each individual campus? Is there any opportunity, if the answer to that is yes, um, to look at how it fits in together as a whole to the whole or the mm -hmm. system? Um, and then more specifically, uh, you know, I don't understand exactly uh, what a higher score is, and um, is this a one to ten score? Uh, and, and if five is, it must be middle of the road, you've got a couple here, at least when we look at state, regional, community. While those are not defined terms in, in terms of what that means, uh, it's, it's ranked, you know, five, which can't be the best, can't be the worst. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, how we're, I mean, that's the only one that seems to me to be tying into the state as a whole, is, is that state regional community, unless that means something else, so, the so value I, to the whole area. I, I will ask uh, uh, Anne to speak to this. Um, one of the things, I, I had the pleasure of touring the library last week, I think it was, or was it earlier this week, Anne? It seems it was Monday. Monday. Uh, uh, and, and what we have is a world-class library um, that actually is a regional leader. And in the case of the libraries, you are probably seeing uh, some discussion about how we benefit the entire region, other states. So I'd, let, I'd like to ask uh, Anna to speak to that. Thank you, Chancellor Cartwright. Um, yes, the libraries are the, we are the largest uh, library in the state of Missouri. Um, we are the only public research library in the state of Missouri as defined by membership in the Association of Research Libraries. We are key members in the statewide Mobius <coughs> Consortium. We loan uh, thousands of uh, materials all over the state every day. And this has uh, been a traditional part of our mission. Uh, the way that the libraries are part of the land-grant mission is uh, in part fulfilling this uh, obligation to provide information across the state. The library depository edition is especially important to us because, as, as you all well know, libraries are, have been undergoing and are undergoing a period of tremendous change. 80% of our journals now that we subscribe to are only online. They don't exist in paper form. We have a huge legacy collection, though, and a legacy collection means things we've had for a long time. And we have a tremendous obligation to uh, research libraries in general to the state of Missouri, to our students and researchers here at MU to retain materials that we've acquired over time. Libraries are in a unique position where we preserve the past, we serve the present, and we try to predict the needs of researchers of the future. Uh, with this depository edition, we'll be able to preserve the materials we have, and you heard about uh, the troubles that we're having in our in our rented facility. Also, you know, I know that the university's priority is to get out of leased facilities. We currently have a partial partial storage that's leased. So I mean, this this fits with uh, getting out of lease. It's cost effective getting out of leased uh, places. Plus, it's giving us the opportunity to help build the libraries of the future, to uh, serve our students more effectively. We work with our university library student advisory committee. Uh, to get their ideas, we uh, are the second most used building, Ellis Library, I should say our main library, is the second most visited building on campus after the Student Center. And we don't serve food, Student <laughs> Center does. Um, so we're, we really appreciate your consideration of this. This is uh, something that addresses our statewide and really international mission as part of the network of research libraries. I'd be happy to answer any other questions anyone has. Thank you. I think that's a great explanation. Um, and, and just since we're, this is our first meeting talking about this new process, um, I'm really focused more on, on the process um, as opposed to really uh, questioning the need for any of these things um, in a vacuum. I'm certain we need all of these things and more. Um, but just in terms of how we're going to prioritize different needs of the campuses, um, I know that that's a $5 million ask, and that's a relatively small number. 
Um, but I'm trying to understand just in terms of how we are going to be prioritizing these tasks as a system and a whole. And when, you know, I think we'll probably have to, to just, I don't know, tweak some of these scoring um, over time. But I guess from my perspective, um, you know, when we're looking at state and regional community, you know, something that's rated a five, um, I think program plan and how it fits into the strategy are really important. Um, and I think how it serves the community is also important. Um, and there are a lot of projects here that if 10 is the, the highest need, there's a lot of 10s there. And so I'm just, in terms of how we are thinking about that as a board, um, you know, these are questions that I have about how we're going to, alter, instead of we're ranking four different projects, I mean, there could be certain circumstances where it's not, maybe I'm wrong, each campus gets a new something, that one campus needs two new somethings more to the overall strategic plan and the benefit of that campus and the overall uh, system um, than you know, around Robin. And that's, that's just for discussion. No, I think that's an excellent point. We're trying to get away to, from the spread the peanut butter approach to this, but I think you bring up some very good points that there will be need to be adjustments. <coughs> the board might want to think going forward whether there would be either committee or finance chairman in the <coughs> scoring process prior to bringing it to the board. And obviously, I, you know, I think if you've got donors who, who say, you know, I, I want to fund this project, if we've approved it, you know, all these projects are going to be approved. I mean, it's going to shift around and maybe it's funded, but I, I, I just think that when we're talking about what we're going to prioritize, we should be looking at a scoring methodology that that ties it to the system as a whole and the value to the overall system as opposed to each individual <coughs> campus. But you just said triggered something, and, and I think it's a really good point you've raised, Julia. Um, so who did uh, the, the spreadsheet that we saw? I sort of assumed that the finance committee was involved so, so that you this isn't the first time you've seen it. Having these materials is the first time those of us weren't on the committee, but was it totally administration? And if so, was it university administration? Or was this a, a uh, each campus did their own evaluation of their projects? I'll let Ryan speak there. I think it was a combination. So, so at this point in the pro process, it's each campus. Um, as we move forward and we work towards the March meeting, the system will get involved in that and will also involve the finance committee. I, I think that the main point today is we wanted to make sure there's nothing on here that you say doesn't seem to fit with the strategy. I, I think this list that you'll see that we bring back in March will be smaller. So, so part of it's we're willing to let them go through this first gate. Just getting through gate A doesn't mean that you're going to go through gate B and gate C. So w was there a hand from the university, whether it was President Choi or someone else, or do we have four different chancellors using potentially four different thought processes in how you give grades and putting them together? Because, I mean, uh, if there isn't oversight at that stage, then you can't, you, you, you can't really sure. use apples and oranges. Yes, uh, absolutely. So the system leadership did get involved. I was aware of these projects ever since I joined back in March. So we've had deep discussions. For example, uh, for UMKC, when they bring up the science and engineering complex combined with the free enterprise zone, that's been a high priority for them <laughs> ever since they began fundraising for this uh, several years ago, as well as the conservatory. So these conversations were had. And now what we're gonna do is identify where the funding is going to come from so that we can bring it to the board with our priorities in March. I'm not sure today's the day to get to dig too deep into this, but at some point I'd like to have further discussion about how the chancellors went about perceiving the relative number system. Uh, I think on each campus it doesn't make a difference, uh, but when you begin comparing campuses because they may, may have been harder grading themselves on certain areas mm -hmm. than another campus may have given different weight. So um, uh, 
I think I think we ought to. That's a that's a good discussion. Think about that a little bit a little bit more. No, I think that's a great point. As I said, this is all we're in an evolutionary stage, in my opinion. Here, I I will say, just from my perspective, that we are at such a preliminary stage where it's really. I don't know how you can prioritize until financing is, is set, for example, and all we're doing is giving permission to go do that and a rough idea of whether or not we agree with the campus priorities. It might, that's just my view of, of what we're doing. Maybe as financing takes shape before our spring meeting, so might we have some further way of making sure that the campuses are looking at their respective projects and ranking them with the same the same uh, view of grading, mm -hmm. so to speak. I think that's a great point. Together as a group, I think that'd yeah. be good. <clears throat> just, a a yeah, just a comment on that. I think it's, I think it's good that the campuses use their own subjective. I don't, I don't have a problem with it that they use their own subjective viewpoints on doing what's best for us. We're the check and balance to make sure that it's good for the system overall. So I don't really have a problem with their subjective viewpoints right now, and I think that they're entitled to that. And, but when it gets to the system level, then that's going to be our job to. And I agree with you, yeah. Darrell. Okay. We, we do have a motion and a second, but any more discussion? Because I think this is a very important discussion, and, and I clearly have brought up some points that we need to address. Any, any more discussion? This is a committee yeah, motion. This, this is a, there's a motion and a second, so with no more discussion, Cindy, would you call the roll of the committee? Curator Bernsick? Yes. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sunbolt? Yes. All committee votes in favor. N now, uh, I'm going to ask uh, the committee if they have a further motion. Uh, um, I think Curator Sunbolt might, which will go through the committee, but then we'll, I'll ask permission to make the motion to the board as a whole. Yeah, I make the motion the uh, Board of Curators approve the Translational Precision Medical Complex as the highest priority capital project for the University of Missouri system. Is this an amendment to the motion that's pending before the board, or is this a No, this is a separate motion. Do I get board approval of the first motion? Well, we, I thought we, I, I did not believe we were seeking board approval on, on gate A. Ryan? That, that is correct. Yeah, that's my understanding of, of the process. I'll second that. Any discussion? This is, this is, it may seem like a simple motion, but it is actually a significant change in the way the University of Missouri has operated. And if you use the word system, and I have flinched every time everybody has, but you notice I haven't said anything, or whether you're saying all four campuses and, and university-wide, uh, this is a change and a significant change. And I, I will agree with you one more thing, Curator Phillips, and, and we have got to drive. If we're going to do this kind of action, then we have a responsibility and a commitment to make sure that it is good for the every campus that we have. You're ready for a committee vote? And try, drive that collaboration, yes. Curator Bernsick? Yes. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sunbold. Yes. Okay. You have all committee votes in favor? Is there Mr. a motion for the entire board? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion that the Board of Curators approve the Translational uh, Precision Medicine Complex as the highest pr priority capital project for the University of, of Missouri as a whole. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Cindy, would you call the roll? Curator Bernsick? Yes. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sunbold? Yes. Okay. You have all votes in favor. Mr. Chairman, that, that is the, we have completed uh, MU. We're going to move on to MU Health. I didn't know whether, when and where the chairman wants to break or... You know, I think uh, a good point. I think it's uh, 10 until 11. Let's take a, a very short uh, eight or 10 minute break here, no longer, and we'll resume shortly. As a uh, point of information, we're going to uh, have a box lunch brought in. We're going to work through lunch because uh, 
I think there are many people here on the board and also university uh, folks who are going to head over at 1.30 for that uh, presentation. Curator Sunbold has informed me that if we do not break for the Norm Stewart statute that he will never forgive me. So. Yeah, we, uh, so we've, we've got a lot to do, and, I and, and we, want, we want to have discussion. Discussion is important, but we do have uh, an important thing to adjourn to at uh, shortly before 1.30. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now, uh, Chancellor Cartwright will, well, we made a, we have changed from my notes. Jonathan Cartwright will present the MU Health uh, Care Preliminary Five-Year Capital Plan. Uh, thank you, curators and uh, President Choi and chancellors. Uh, we are delighted to provide a, uh, a capital update, capital budget update, and, and ask for the Gate A approval. I'm learning my terms here uh, for several items. Uh, I, briefly, I'd like to tell the, the committee that we have a strategic planning process along with MU Health with uh, uh, Dean uh, Delafontaine. Uh, and out of that strategic planning process, we have an executive capital process that reviews all uh, capital items over a million dollars. And then we also have another committee that reviews all capital items under uh, one million dollars. Uh, and and, we're, and we furthermore, we've, we, we have employed a master facility space planning process with the Cannon Group. Uh, and that has informed a lot of what I'm about to uh, present uh, here. Uh, so with that, going to our first uh, item, uh, I can assure you the first item is not as uh, sexy, if you will, as the uh, TPMC, uh, but nevertheless is, is important. Uh, and it is for a review, or is, is to look at the uh, building exterior for Women's and Children's Hospital. This building was built in the early 70s. It is 45 years old in many regards. It is it, it has uh, served its useful life. We have put uh, many millions of dollars into it, but this is uh, the continuing continuance of that. Uh, like many people that have uh, older homes, we noticed uh, there, there was some water infiltration in our rooms and in inpatient rooms, as well as thank you, uh, as well as uh, uh, within uh, our windows. And and from that, we commissioned a study uh, to look at the uh, building skin, if you will. And out of that, we believe that we need to make some significant uh, updates on the skin of uh, women's and children's hospital. The request for this is approximately $15 million, and uh, it is our number one priority for uh, fiscal year uh, 2019. And Mr. Chairman, would you like for me to review all of them, or would you like for me to go uh, one at a time? I, I think we'll kind of play it by ear, but let's ask on this particular one, are there any questions? And particularly, I'd like you if there are no other questions to discuss, what, what you mean by university funds? Because MU Health, is, is like the athletic department, has its own source of funding. Uh, good, good catch. Thank you very much. Uh, this would all be paid for out of our ongoing capital dollars. Uh, we have a capital budget that's approximately 7% of our net patient revenue, and that would be uh, how we pay for all of this. And it'd be out of the operations, basically. Good catch. Thank you. I appreciate you breaking it out like that, but what you're saying is MU Health Funds. Absolutely, and maybe we could make that a, a, a amendment in our presentations in the future. Happy to do that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on this? Go, go ahead. Uh, All right, very good. Uh, the second one. Um, uh, if you've been out to Women's and Children's Hospital, we, there is a large facility that is uh, also attached to the hospital. Um, and it, it is uh, our what we call the health pavilion. Uh, this building was uh, sold uh, to a real estate investment trust uh, uh, several years ago, 1998. Uh, we have paid a lease payment on that since 1998. Uh, it is where our uh, outpatient surgery center is, as well as our large uh, uh, multi-specialty practice for our pediatrics practice, as well as obstetrics. Uh, this facility uh, is going to be sold along with six other facilities throughout the United States by this real estate investment trust. Uh, and we anticipate that if it's sold, uh, that uh, it would be uh, even more expensive in the future with the lease payments. We have first right of refusal on this building. Uh, and so uh, we would at least like to entertain the option of, of being able to purchase this in the future. Uh, same comment as uh, Curator Steelman said before, this would be paid for uh, out of the total capital of, that MU Healthcare has out of its operations. And happy to entertain any questions on this one. 
let me ask this question. Uh, your lease expires in 2020? Yes. Are you planning on trying to purchase it before then? Yeah, that's what this would be. Right now. That's okay. what this would be. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Have you looked into building your own or just releasing? Uh, th that will be coming up. Uh, th this, this, this one, uh, like several others, would be contingent upon uh, anything that we would be doing with our potential with Boone Hospital. That was my question. Are these requests being made in light of that potential merger, or um, if, that, <coughs> if that goes through, are we going to be amend? Or do you guys plan on amending these? Absolutely, there would be changes coming forward, and this this one should be noted in that same uh, vein. Is there a lot of interaction between this particular building and the women's and children's hospital? Uh, absolutely. Uh, th th that's the beauty of that of that piece of property, if you will. And the way it was designed is that it's a large ambulatory practice, so lots of clinic space, outpatient surgery space, and it is uh, smack dab right attached to women's and children's hospital. So there's there's good reason then to be Ab trying to purchase this rather than looking for something else or leasing something or building a new one, whatever. <laughs> because it's right next to it. And we would like to at least uh, be able to uh, explore uh, the, appro uh, the approval uh, or the, pl uh, the purchase of this in the, on the ongoing basis. So we have first drive refusals. We'd like to be able to review that. Okay. <coughs> Number three, uh, the primary care uh, clinic facility. Um, this is a picture of our South Providence clinic. So what, what, what we're uh, purchase or potentially purchasing, it will be a lot less than, uh, than what was uh, done here. But uh, we have a goal. Uh, uh, MU Healthcare uh, has a longstanding uh, tradition of investing uh, uh, major dollars and major resources in primary care services with the Department of Family Medicine uh, and the like. In every quadrant of the city, uh, we would like to have a major uh, primary care presence. Uh, and this would, this would be in one of two places. It would either be in the south side of town uh, near Rockbridge High School for a landmark uh, or on the north side of town near Battle High School. Uh, both, uh, there's, there's a need in both sections, uh, and so we're actively looking at sites for that. Uh, we have uh, the continue, even if you include all of the primary care uh, staff uh, at, with MU Healthcare as well as the primary physicians, primary care physicians with Boone Hospital. Uh, there is still a, a, a need for approximately 10 FTEs of primary care physicians. Uh, we want to very much uh, be able to provide this service. It is an absolute strategic priority for us. Uh, as well as cardiovascular and oncology, uh, but those are the, the primary care will be one of our uh, primary strategic priorities. Happy to answer any questions about this request. The, uh, the category that you have up on the screen varies slightly from the category that we had um, dated November 10. Uh, the categories that we had uh, show internal five million you have it under university funds. Is this the same? This comes out of your... Every one of these that say university funds uh, will be 100% funded by MU Healthcare. Okay. And, we, and we, will, we will make that uh, uh, change in the future, yes. All right. So primary care, major priority for us. Any other questions on that? Okay. Uh, our second uh, major priority that came out of our strategic planning process is around cardiovascular. Uh, cardiovascular service line is something we're going to be making and be going to be making a major investment in uh, and on the, over the next uh, several years. Uh, think of this as the next priority beyond orthopedics. Uh, this is going to be absolutely critical for us uh, going forward. Uh, we're putting together a business plan as we speak uh, for general cardiologists. There is not enough access into general cardiology in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, we also know that there's a major problem with electrophysiology uh, and the uh, epidemic of atrial fibrillation. Uh, and we know that our current facilities are inadequate uh, to really be a destination service for cardiovascular disease. And when I say that, uh, in a service line, think of this as uh, it's similar in a sense of the TPMC. Uh, cardiovascular is a service line, cardiologists, cardiovascular surgeons, 
uh, vascular surgeons, vascular medicine, imaging, and the like. These will all be uh, physicians and staff that will be playing uh, in, the, in the same sandbox, if you will, around a cardiovascular uh, service line. Uh, this facility, uh, it, it, we've noted two options that are there. We could potentially uh, put it within the existing university hospital footprint, uh, or it could be located uh, to the east side of our campus uh, near the phys uh, physician's medical building. Uh, we're still looking into this. However, we want, uh, we, this is approximately 15 to $16 million, once again, out of MU Healthcare funds. Uh, it will be a major priority for us. <coughs> we, want, we want the board to know about this uh, in advance. Happy to answer any questions about that. Jonathan, a different price uh, internal building in the hospital or building your own building? Any, I mean. I think that that would be need, need to be done as a part of our planning process. Uh, it's been my take, Curious Unbold, that uh, renovations of existing facilities oftentimes are more expensive than new facilities. Any more questions on uh, the yeah, capital, five-year capital plan for MU Healthcare? John, do you have? No, he's got one. And then, there, and then I, I, as a note item, uh, there's, the, there's one more uh, request here uh, uh, that would be related to Boone Hospital. Uh, if things do not progress with Boone Hospital, we want the Cur Board of Curators to know that uh, we, on, our, on our university hospital campus, the main campus that holds uh, uh, 205 of our uh, beds uh, and a lot of our uh, practice, if you will, it was built in 1956. This building uh, is served us well, and we've made major, major investments in it. However, uh, it, it is uh, past its useful life, and we want the, the board to be aware that this will be uh, potentially coming down the pike uh, if things do not progress with Boone Hospital. The same thing can be said for women and children. Uh, the facilities or the dollars that potentially it would get approved for the skin as well as the uh, medical pavilion, uh, th those are buildings that have once again are, are older buildings uh, and, and that would potentially, is for, and we are full for sure at women and children. So that would be another item uh, that is out there. And then if we truly want to be a destination uh, medical community, and I think we do, uh, more and more and more of our, of our dollars will be need, to, need to be invested, capital dollars need to be invested in a multi-specialty group practice uh, analogous to what they would have at the Cleveland Clinic or at Mayo. Uh, and a lot of these dollars that are out there over the next, I would say, five to ten years uh, are going to be things that I think that the board would need to, need to know about it. Now, if things do progress with Boone Hospital, that does not mean that we won't have to spend any of these dollars. I want to be clear on that. Uh, however, we, we do, I want the board to know that this is that we're pro, trying to be proactive and, and, and thinking about contingencies. Yes. Quick question, Jonathan. Um, is there a re uh, it's great you guys can fund a lot of your projects. You guys are, you know, um, uh, have, a, have a substantial revenue stream. But gifts, is there a reason why you guys not pursue gifts? Is it, um, why not go after gift money as well? I mean, just explain that to me. If I promised the board I did not ask him to say this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm here to, it, I think that philanthropy could be a major, major part of us. There are so many grateful patients that I think could, would be very interested in partnering with us into the future. Uh, Robert Driver has just been named as our, uh, philanthropy leader leader and he is he and I are actively working on this together uh, we must do a better job than this we uh, on average we only we only are able to uh, raise about two million dollars a year we should be able to raise significantly more than that uh, and I think that that's a great priority a great comment and thanks for bringing it up so this is the one that I would have some questions on uh, as to number one the amount yes uh, actually in our materials prior I think we were identified as the expansion being 450 how much 450 no well, I may be you've got 150 to two million 200 million for the expansion of women's and children's that's the expansion and how do we get to 450 I'm looking at the at the one-page sheets. 
I'll, I will take responsibility for that. Uh, th these are ranges uh, for sure, uh, and uh, I, I will do a better job in working with our financial staff and with uh, Mr. Rapp's team to make sure that these numbers tie up better in the future, and I apologize for that. But you don't have uh, uh, a half a billion dollars. Uh, no. That's what that, that line is. That's half a billion. To, to do an inpatient and outpatient expansion uh, so I've got a couple of questions. One is, um, should it, well, I think we all hope that, uh, that we get an arrangement with Moon County, yes. which will be expensive, but nothing like this. Um, and that's a great solution. But uh, if it doesn't happen, uh, will we, would you be looking in part to bonding authority from the university? Do we do that? Um, gifts would be part of it but then my second question is um, what are your thoughts about the future five and ten years from now about the need for hospital beds beyond the near term bursting at the seams you're bursting at the seams now but in five or ten years uh, unless the feds ease up on us they're going to be wanting us to do a lot of primary in-home uh, and ancillary care, not in the hospital. So uh, are we really going to end up either with Boone County or otherwise spending that kind of money largely on inpatient? Well, in answer to your first question, I would be working with Mr. Rapp and, and, and the, the rest of the uh, crew uh, to come up with funding options that are out there. Your point's well taken. Uh, from a day's cash on hand perspective, we would not be able to just pay for this out, 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 outright. And so bonding would need to be potentially a solution we'd look at. So I freely admit that that's the case. Uh, in regards to what this would potentially buy us, uh, it, would, it would be looking into the future. It'd be making major, major investments in ambulatory practices. Um, and that would be um, the view, I would view this uh, as placeholders, it's just to say that this is uh, things that we're going to have to think about in the future, uh, and, and that's one piece of it. It is not necessarily going to be expanding our facilities. Uh, it would be a replacement a lot of a lot of our facilities that are, that are out there, but we'd be looking at new models that are out there. Uh, and how can we shrink the number of inpatient beds, if you will? How do we switch it so we can do more and more cases and more and more pa take care of more and more patients on an ambulatory basis, decrease our length of stay, and become that much more efficient? Uh, suffice to say that uh, every healthcare system in the United States is looking at new models that are out there to make it so that patients <coughs> don't have to come to the hospital, and we can take care of those patients in the lowest cost setting there is. Uh, for example, Cap Region, we need to do a much better job of keeping patients in Cole County and Jeff City at our facility that's based in Jeff City. Uh, that's a much lower cost structure, uh, and it would make it so the patients don't necessarily have to come to uh, uh, our highest setting, highest cost setting, which is our academic medical center. So, uh, so, so I, I think that's a really good answer. You're really saying this is a placeholder, that there's going to be substantial expenditure, but it could end up being largely for ambulatory and outpatient and not necessarily new beds. Absolutely. When we did this, when I was at Indiana University and we were potentially looking at, a, at a consolidating those two hospitals in Indiana, Indiana there was a, actually a 44 percent decrease in the number of beds that were actually going to be constructed and significantly more dollars invested in ambulatory. So if we did anything like this, it would be uh, to change the model of care so that we could take care of patients into the future. I could speak. I of everything on here, uh, and I'm not. Oh, and I'm not going to uh, talk up, rock the boat. But if there's anything on here that I don't think really fits within what we're doing and the five-year plan, I actually think this is it. Uh, and I personally have some concerns about approving uh, it in this manner. But it is a number that, because of other ongoing things, <coughs> needs to be aware of. And as a placeholder, it may be okay. So I will just tell you that, that going forward, this, as other people make tweaks, this is something that I would not normally expect to see in the five-year capital plan. Um, that, that, that's good. Um, I, I would say it's a campus priority six, but if Boone <coughs> County doesn't move forward 
uh, your priority moves up uh, because you, you do have to do something, not for a half billion dollars, but you'll have to do something in order to meet your, your vision for the MU Health. Indeed. Indeed. Jonathan, can I ask, obviously a half billion dollars is a very large, very round number. What kind of goes back to what John says. I mean, you have a better ballpark number for this? Ballpark, you should budget approximately a, a million dollars per bed. And so uh, it's approximately 200 at Wimsey Children's as well as the 300 that are there. <coughs> Chairman. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, how much money is in your capital budget right now? It's approximately 7% of our net patient revenue. So ballpark, we have around $70 million every year that we expend for capital. $70 million. Yes. Do you, can you accumulate? You can accumulate that, could you not? No. You can't? Could, we could not. The, the normal, just to keep our facilities running and the necessary dollars that are out there to, to to invest is we, we spend that significantly every year. So you we need, have more, you, we have you need more that, requests than You really that. need that then to keep keep it up to date and so forth. Absolutely. What, whatever the particular yes. project might be. Yeah. And that's a very that number that I gave you is a very reasonable number uh, that most places would Well I was hoping you had two hundred and fifty million dollars in that budget so that you could do some of these things right now. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on MU Health? If there's uh, no I, further. I, I guess I'd make a comment. Uh, there isn't anybody on the board, including me, that really uh, has a grasp on the needs. And we're heavily dependent on, uh, on Jonathan and President Choi and uh, on, on the Chancellor. Uh, but I am glad that, we're, that we have the opportunity to see what the long-term plans are. So. Uh, Someday, maybe there'll be a physician with some greater knowledge on the board. I, I, I want to say that publicly, that it would be good to have somebody. I don't know the last time we've had a physician on there. Uh, been a long time. Might have been Hugh. Was it Hugh Stevenson? That would be Probably the he? last one. Hugh. Been a while, yeah. So, um, but thanks for presenting this, even if, it, even if it's uh, beyond our level of expertise. If there are no further discussions, may I have a, a motion and a second from the Finance Committee to approve the further uh, planning and development of the uh, University of Missouri Healthcare projects presented today as outlined in the board materials uh, to you as part of the MU Healthcare Preliminary Five-Year Capital Plan. So moved. Second. I'll second the motion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, board Cindy go. <coughs> Cindy, you can call the roll of the Finance Committee. Curator Bernsick? Yes. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. <coughs> yes. All votes in favor. Yeah, more Chairman. We have, uh, whenever you're ready, we're ready to move forward to the preliminary five year capital plan for University of Missouri, Kansas City. All right. <coughs> Good morning. This morning I'll cover four projects uh, that are on UMKC's preliminary capital planning list. I'm going to put these in what I think is chronological order. Um, so I'm first going to talk about the School of Computing and Engineering uh, Education Research Center combined with the Free Enterprise Center. As you all know, Kansas City is one of the most concentrated areas in the country. Uh, for engineering and architecture firms. Over the past nine years, our enrollments in our School of Computing and Engineering have over doubled to 1,600, and we expect to, re to reach a over 2,500 in the foreseeable future. Our research groups, or our research grows out of the School of Computing and Engineering as well. <coughs> Excuse me. We have advanced weaponry. Uh, research, we will soon be announcing federally funded research um, that continues in that trend that's partnership um, with MU and with Missouri S&T for $7.2 million. Um, and we also 
uh, need space to accommodate the research and the growing teaching and educational needs that we have. Um, we are also engaged in doing quite a bit related to workforce development and research partnerships with uh, employers in Kansas City, such as Honeywell, uh, DST, uh, Dunn Construction, Black and & Veatch, and, and others. Um, and so what we're proposing here is a uh, project that is a combination of new and renovated space. It's over 44 thousand gross square feet facility um, that's located just north of our existing Robert W. Flarsheim Science and Technology Hall will provide a new flexible classroom space and much needed improved laboratory space that can accommodate our students and house and house small and large scale equipment um, and that's vital to our civic our civil uh, mechanical and electrical engineering and computer science programs. Um, as originally submitted on June, in June of 2013, uh, we had a freestanding UMKC Free Enterprise Center uh, that we had um, planned to have a freestanding structure on the corners of Volcker and Brookside. Um, we have moved um, the Free Enterprise Center into this space. Um, uni university leadership's taken steps to embed the Free Enterprise Center and its key components within the planned 44,000 gross square foot um, School of Computing and Engineering and this new Educational Research Center that uh, we're proposing. This is one of our highest capital priorities because the integrated combination of the Education Research Center as well as the FEC project um, will be constructed in the heart of the Volcker campus adjacent to um, and connected with our existing home. Uh, that gives us the opportunity to better serve our currently um, roughly 1,600 students and our 90 IPHD students in engineering and um, to accommodate our growth plans and also to allow us to better partner on particular areas of focus um, with our community, uh, our community connections. We need larger and more interactive lab space and the classrooms will allow our faculty uh, to optimize their teaching, their mentoring, and their research uh, in hands-on laboratory experience. Uh, these will, um, this facility will house 3D printing, um, some sophisticated equipment, <coughs> and uh, it will be located not only in our academic quad, but also accessible to the community um, coming off of Rock Hill Road. Uh, so again, one of our goals in computing and engineering is to meet the workforce and economic development objectives of, the, of Kansas City. Um, we are constantly in conversations with, with uh, um, companies such as Cerner and Garmin and Sprint and again Honeywell and others uh, to help grow their needs in these particular areas. Happy to answer any questions on this particular item. I just have a general question or maybe it's more of a statement uh, first. Um, UMK seems to consistently do an excellent job of getting gifts uh, provided um, from the community. I uh, don't mean to look ahead in the slide deck. Um, what do you attribute that to? What do we attribute to getting good gifts from the community? Your ability to fundraise better than what seems to be the rest of the campuses. I, I think it, um, if I was speaking more as the provost probably than as the interim chancellor, I would say it's that our we do our best to make sure that our academic programming meets the needs of the region. Do you think there's a way or an opportunity to partner with some of the other universities in that regard? Uh, actually, for example, I, um, as I mentioned, that we're, we will be announcing soon uh, significant federal funding <coughs> that's actually in partnership to, to meet, I think, state and federal needs um, around well, uh, we'll announce that uh, shortly, but but we are in partnership with, with MU and with S&T on that. I do think um, we're actually partnering um, with UCM uh, in their Lee Summit campus to do some things to promote the workforce um, using some of their technical programs and moving them into engineering. And so we're always happy to have partnerships and look for our opportunities to meet those needs. Thank you. <coughs> Julia touches on an interesting uh, situation because the fundraising is done by campus without uh, exchange between the campus fundraisers. And there are situations where there ought to be a university approach to some of the um, metropolitan uh, collaborators. Um, and and uh, UMKC I think is, has been and is willing to, to work on particular projects and, and the PTMC would be an example of where 
some some folks in Kansas City ought to have an interest, uh, and uh, I think UMKC is willing to do that uh, because of the potential collaboration between the schools. So, um, I I I think you've touched on an issue that that uh, looking at now, President Choi, that uh, we we ought to make sure that there is uh, an openness to that both ways. Of course, yeah. yes. I joke with uh, Tom George from time to time about you know, express scripts, uh, but uh, the point the point being made that uh, sometimes a rising tide raises all ships. Just like at Mizzou, uh, when the TPMC is selected as a priority, all of the schools will have to work closely together, like agriculture, medicine, and engineering, to help raise the funds. And as you mentioned before, TPMC is a system activity. And so we have to uh, work closely with the campuses and their donor base to support this very, very important project. But that's just one example. We have to coordinate better in some of these activities. And I do think we'll speak more to that um, when we talk about our fourth project on our list today and what the opportunities are there. I do have a question before you move on. Mm -hmm. so, so you've listed their state request of 5.4. Um, this is uh, a high priority. We, 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 we kind of put uh, the conservatory aside for purposes of these discussions. It's kind of on hold. But this would be the number one priority at UMKC. Is it dependent on getting state approval next year, or are we working toward, I mean, the gifts are already pretty phenomenal. Right. Uh, Actually, I will um, uh, speak to the, the conservatory facility in a moment. Um, on this one, though, we are planning on bringing this to the board in December. Um, because we actually have um, gifts in hand, grants in hand. The state request is um, a lower amount than had, or had been appropriated for the Free Enterprise Center. And so um, we are hopeful that the, um, we will be able to work with the state to have that money, but we do plan on bringing this in December to the board. We do have some gifts um, that, are, that have an end of year deadline. So that's one reason it's important for us to move this one forward. And it's also important to understand the uh, status, which I think you probably do, Curator, of, of the state request. Ryan, do you want to speak to that so that the board can understand exactly where we, because this is a little different situation. C correct, because we're combining two projects. Uh, we actually have $6.6 .6 million that has been appropriated and it is available to us today from the state for the project. What we're seeking would be in December to come back and move forward, and we'd only need $5.4 to make the project move forward. In other words, in this case, we have the state money. Yes. Sorry, sorry for the long-winded response. Yes, I, I have a question. Uh, can you give me an estimate on the number of students that would go through this facility over the course of a full year? Uh, y y well, just in terms of the School of Computing and Engineering students alone, that's um, right now 1,600 students. Um, but then in Flarsheim and, and using that facility, we have an, a number of other um, natural science related programs. We have physics using that space. We have chemistry using that space. So um, I, I can't tell you exactly, but I know at the minimum it would be that 1,600. Can I ask, and this is a comment more than a question on this, and it actually goes to part of what you were talking about, Julia, too, uh, and I'm not taking the chancellor by surprise. I told her. I, I am, again, as we're, as we're trying to make this, this process work and we're trying to take it seriously, uh, and I know this is a sensitive issue, uh, to me, I th I, I'm not comfortable with the pr priority of the conservatory right now as one, and this one is two, because as I would understand how we set priorities, this is, is the kind of project that very much deserves to be called the top priority on a campus. It does not only meet all of the state's requirements of, of workforce training and development, the regions, the uh, uh, external funding, it, for example, on, on the uh, Scoring it has a conservatory at 10 and this one is 10, but this in this project the gifts have actually basically financed the whole operation with with some state money uh, Again, I don't want to rock the boat, but as we move forward and think about this uh, 
I think it is a mistake for this not to be the number one priority. And, and I understand we have sensitive issues, but sensitive issues are what we as a board are supposed to deal with and what we're going to ask our chancellors to deal with, and that is to make those kind of tough uh, uh, decisions and statements. <laughs> but I'm looking at you, John, because I know this is a particular interest to you. Yeah, well, um, I, I think they're equally critical. Um, I think. UMKC considers this one a done deal. I asked the question to make the point, we're not going back for more state funding for this project. It's, it's, it's that close, it just needs approval next month. Can I interrupt, but that's what I, I would not like to see moving forward on the capital planning, is to play that kind of game, which is to move some, Well, no, it, it is somewhat, and I don't mean it pejoratively, it is a game to say we want to elevate this to one because we want to move it, but we're putting this on two because it's a done deal. I actually believe if we're taking our position seriously as a board, I believe that a done deal should be number one. Well, I actually thought that, that the, both of those projects had been somewhat grandfathered. And we've known for months that the engineering computer school was going to be done because of the, all the private gifts. So the conservatory, I'm not sure it deserves a one or a five. It, it's either going to happen or it isn't based on refiguring that. So uh, we, we may be semantically. I think we are. I don't, I don't think we yeah. disagree other than yeah. I, I think moving forward I'd like the process and the prioritizations and the numbers to be more meaningful. I agree with you on that. And I would agree on that as well. I would say that um, when we first started um, putting numbers to these, uh, they were both pretty close to being done deals. Um, and so I will speak to the second, the second project, um, the Conservatory of Music and Dance um, and a new facility, facility or um, for that. Um, again, to the, the criteria, I would just mention um, to uh, the curator's questions earlier about um, scoring. This is high because number one, um, this is part of UMKC's mission um, is to excel in the arts. Um, we have the one of the oldest programs in the country um, in our conservatory. It was founded in 1906, which was one year after Juilliard was founded. Um, we have in our, con in our conservatory um, uh, regional impact and a state impact that includes, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, that, that includes um, support around the state. We are in our conservatory alums are in every county in the state serving as choir directors in churches and in schools, uh, significant present in, presence in Branson and of course uh, it, both in Kansas City and in St. Louis in terms of the economic development that occurs around um, music and culture. We have, um, in, uh, as an outgrowth of the conservatory, um, the roots in developing and founding the symphony in Kansas City, the ballet in Kansas City, the lyric opera, um, relation with the Missouri rep, and of course, um, uh, all those who do this work in an entrepreneurial fashion. Um, so as that mission of excelling and leading in the, in the visual and performing arts is part of what our core is at UMKC, we also have creditors who have let us know in their last review process that we have outgrown our facilities, we, they are outdated, and they are a health hazard to our students. And our next accreditor visits are in 2020 and 2021 from the National Association of Schools of Music and the National Association of Schools of Dance. And so, um, and you will see in your documents uh, some of the quotes from our accreditors previously about um, our needs in this space. Um, we currently serve about 500 students, roughly 525. Um, as we grow our conservatory, we're looking to a number that is about 24% um, greater than that, with 620 students. Um, what we are doing at this point in time, given some of the changes that occurred in the summer, um, around our plans for financing. We've been working with a small group of people and with um, great donor support to realign two sets of four factors. One set of four factors includes to make sure that in any new um, re-envisioning of the space that we're talking about utilizing, that we make sure we meet our programming space needs. That's number one. Number two, to make sure that um, our facility um, is, is workable as we're building on space. Uh, three, to make sure that our location uh, actually has the parameters we need for the traffic and the movement. 
um, in the facility. And uh, fourth, that we have the financial plan to be able to afford that. We're working on those set of four factors while we're also working on the four factors of making sure a re-envisioned facility meets the needs of our and is, is um, comfortable with our faculty, comfortable with our donors, comfortable with our um, system leadership, and comfortable with our city leadership. So as we work on that, it is important to us to move as expeditiously as we possibly can to address this need. Um, we are hoping to come back to you uh, in the spring semester uh, with a plan for that. And uh, in, in order to do that, and because we've opened up um, um, new considerations, we have signaled to our community that we are now looking beyond um, the single space um, as our project site, and we're considering some other possibilities as well. We've contacted all of our major donors, and they are supportive of the work that we're doing. Um, and we appreciate their patience tremendously. So again, we plan to bring this to you um, in the spring semester as soon as we can. Three points <clears throat> that I'd like to, to, to make. One is when I'm looking at the priority score between the two projects we just talked about, and, and now that we know that this was done campus-based, this may be reflective. So the conservatory ended up with a priority score of 7.55. The engineering school, although very important, was uh, 7.45, lower. So the campus ranked the conservatory higher, uh, although I don't know how much administration had oversight. So that's an interesting uh, thing for us to think about uh, when you're having the campuses do the prioritization. Uh, uh, the second thing uh, is this is another area where I would hope that we as a board would look to the campuses to collaborate. You've got a great music program on the Columbia campus. I think you have a, a, a great smaller program on the St. Louis campus. I think you have a uh, an internationally recognized program on the Kansas City campus, and I don't think there's much collaboration going on. Uh, each one has its own merits. Um, uh, I think voice is particularly good on the Columbia campus uh, comp and composition. Um, composition in, in Kansas City, but totally different uh, audience and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, students. Uh, so. There's no reason why they can't both grow if we, if we encourage collaboration. So that's the second point. The third point is um, it's iffy at this point because UMKC's got to solve it. And, and if it's going to be solved, it'll be a public-private partnership. And uh, I don't think that they'll be coming back for additional promises from the university. Early on, there was uh, uh, some uh, level that was committed, uh, I think, by President Choi about maybe financing and, and ending up with a contribution. And uh, uh, so I don't think it's a big dilemma for the board. I think we look to UMKC to, to solve the issue of finding a, out the right mix. And I'm optimistic that that'll happen. So I don't know that, again, when we're thinking about, well, what's priority number one, what's priority number two, to me, uh, <coughs> We in Kansas City remain optimistic, I think. We think we'll get the problem solved, and I don't think that, uh, that it will be a big issue for the board if, it, it's, if it's solved. If it isn't solved, then you're going to have to do something because we'll lose accreditation, but it won't be what we'd hoped for. But I think, I think the, the folks in Kansas City are still optimistic there'll they'll be a solution. But it's up to UMKC to do it. Bar Barbara's working hard on it. And, and I want to go back to my point about um, the board's um, goal in this process versus the campus's role. It really doesn't matter to me if it's ranked one or five. By the time it gets to us, then we're going to make our own priority um, list of what's important to the system as a whole um, as we move forward. So I'm not too worried about whether it's one or two or what, what the campuses are doing in order to create that process. I think it's something that deserves some weight, but probably not a whole lot of weight as we look at or as we evaluate these projects, because we're looking at different criteria as a, as a board, so. It, my it, any more on that? Because I have one thing I want to address. Uh, and again, this is not to get into a fuss on this, but, but part of this process is that if we're building capital, it's not just a campus problem. Building capital is a decision by the Board of Curators <laughs> as a whole, and so I agree with you, and I'm optimistic that they're trying to uh, 
uh, solve the problem, but we also have other issues. Uh, where does that funds come from? Are there funds being re reallocated? And I don't think this is what you meant, but I just wanted to establish, because this is why we're here today doing this, that capital improvements are not a uh, campus issue. They are a strategic vision of the Board of Curators at the Board of Curators level, and that no deal is a done deal unless the Board of Curators at the Board of Curators level says it's a done deal. And I don't think you are arguing with that, but yeah, I just wanted I to agree. clarify that. Yeah, you, you, we, we, I think the whole Board agrees, and we all bought into this process. And uh, this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. I think it's going pretty well. I would just finish a, to make a couple points on that. One, in terms of collaboration, I'd like to note that our faculty and our leadership in the conservatory have reached out um, on numbers of occasions in the past, um, working particularly with Columbia. We actually have a fair number of our alums who are actually on faculty um, in the School of Music in Columbia, so we do have reason to have partnership there. Um, and I would also say, uh, I, and again, I echo and appreciate um, the importance of the board making strategic decisions about um, capital and about priorities. I do understand this is one that um, started any number of years ago prior to this process and um, has uh, been prolonged in the process because of changes um, in the state and in, in this process. So again, I, I am forever talking to our faculty and our donors and others in the community uh, and community leaders about the fact that this <coughs> is back to the point about um, criteria and rankings um, on, on these sheets that this is one of the oldest programs in the country. It is part of our strategic mission. We have a designation to excel in the arts um, at the UMKC campus, and we have an accreditation issue here. So um, we, will, we will find a solution. Um, moving I on to- uh, I just want to say one thing. I want to thank you and, of course, Leo Morton, because, again, Julia mentioned this earlier, but you all have done a tremendous job um, lining up private donors for both of these facilities we've talked about. And I think that's important to be restated. Thank you. Yeah, and when I asked if you were um, collaborating with the other campuses, I didn't necessarily mean to imply that we should take more of your money, but um, <laughs> whether you could maybe assist um, in what has worked so well with UMKC and being able to um, really get the alignment and the support of its community. Um, I, I just think there are maybe some obvious um, opportunities um, for other campuses to maybe follow that that lead and, and that practice and understand a little bit more closely with how you've built that um, because I think that uh, you know we're here today because we don't have infinite amounts of money and we would love to fund every single project that we need and so to the extent that any of us can improve on those fundraising efforts um, and attain you know, uh, some measure of additional success in those efforts, and I think we should um, really explore them. <coughs> and we're happy to do that. The third project that we're bringing in front of you today um, is the phase two of the Spencer Chemistry and Biological Sciences renovation. Again, the two strengths historically of the UMKC campus are visual and performing arts, as well as the um, the uh, health and life sciences. Uh, as you know, we are one of only 18 um, institutions in the country that have co-located a comprehensive health sciences academic program involving a school of medicine, a school of dentistry, a school of pharmacy, and a school of nursing and health sciences. Um, and to that end, um, we have uh, uh, every student who's on in those programs who comes through UMKC has to go through chemistry and biology. And so what we have here is a facility that um, after phase one of renovation, which is half of the building being renovated, we have a FCNI score of 0.42, which uh, tells you that the building continues to need great repair. Um, and so uh, what we're looking for here is to make sure that our building meets code. Um, we have inadequate, outdated and inadequate space for teaching. Um, and we have safety concerns. And of course, when you're in a chemistry and biology building, you have chemicals and you have um, lab experiments that do have a risk management aspect associated with them. So this is a uh, necessity uh, to find our way to update, upgrade this, um, this second, in the second phase for the building. The project continues
use a renovation of the overall 153,000 square feet, roughly, of the building. The second phase um, is renovating about 75,000 square feet in both the chemistry side as well as the biological sciences side of the building. Um, and what we're looking to do here um, is uh, finish phase one in July 2018 and then start our work to address additional deferred maintenance, research space, teaching spaces, and other facility deficiencies that were beyond the reach of the phase one budget. Um, the renovation will provide state-of-the-art teaching labs. And again, um, when I talk about teaching labs, there's research that's being conducted there, there are experiments being co conducted there, there are chemicals being used there that it's important that we address as well as uh, as animals uh, being used there. Um, so we need to address that in the support sp spaces and make sure that we have improved laboratory systems to support our research activities and meet current lab standards and encourage uh, students' collaborative learning. Again, you can anticipate that on our health sciences campuses, um, we have roughly 3,370 students. Um, we have many more who come through the pipeline before there. Um, before they get to those programs and of course they also take these courses for physics and geology and and other programs as well and we have roughly a thousand students a week going through this facility happy to answer any questions for you uh, again we have some some gifts um, that we've already built in for this we are looking to the state to finish this request um, we are prepared to to try to do our part to um, do development around this depending on what state appropriations are available um, but this has been part again of a larger process um, that that uh, predates um, this particular process with the curators and uh, so we're just continuing on the the original plan Question, if you don't mind. Again, the gifts, that's very impressive. Um, as far as the state request, I believe in the, in the engineering building, you were asking for 5.4, and I think we already have. Okay, so that's baked in. Is this? No. Okay. So help me understand that process, because I would assume that the board would determine if we go to the state. Is that? or Yes. You know, because in other words, just looking at this sheet, it's extremely impressive that you've, obviously, that we've already got the 5.4. But on this, we don't have it, and then it's you're just suggesting that we do the state versus university funds, or well, because help me this is phase that. two of a renovation that we've two. already okay. completed, um, or we're completing the first phase. That was the original plan, and again, I would look to either Vice Chancellor Lindenbaum or Associate Vice Chancellor. Is this Thompson. related to the infrastructure type bill, David, or I don't know? Okay. So. Sure. This is currently on our FY19 uh, capital appropriation list that was submitted in July or August. Okay, we so that was made done, a request. That was done because we, we, okay, I think I understand that. Yeah, but, but then this process will inform what we submit the next year. So, so I think, to your point, we'll be thinking about this as we move between this right. meeting and March about What's the possibility? Are there other alternatives? We submitted this stuff based on thoughts. This vote past. does not mean yeah. we will submit it to the state. This is it into the top gotcha. of the bucket and is being considered. Oh, I understand. Again, I would say on all three of these, all of the first three um, projects I've talked about, they have already been significantly in the works for some years in some cases. So our last project that we'll talk about is one that is actually um, we're just starting to envision and moving forward and, and signaling that so so this is our first clean um, project uh, so to speak any other questions left on Spencer thank you very much um, the last pr uh, project is actually um, under one um, project name is a series of five projects again I mentioned that we are um, have a designation of uh, excellence in health sciences uh, in Kansas City on the UMKC campus and is one of our strategic priorities. I, again, I, uh, you are all aware, I know, of the fact that um, we uh, earlier in the spring uh, rolled out with our partners on the health sciences campus, a health sciences district. Uh, we have in the area where our health sciences programs are, um, the Jackson County Medical Examiner, the Kansas City Department of Health, the Center for Behavioral, um, medicine and a uh, number of um, other partners. We partner with Children's Mercy Hospital. We partner with Truman Medical Center. We also partner beyond 
Hospital Hill with St. Luke's and with Research Medical Center. Um, and we also do some collaboration with the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, we have a unique um, opportunity at UMKC in that, again, having those four academic programs co-located uh, means that we are able to connect around interprofessional education. And interprofessional education is something that accreditors are beginning to actually signal all schools of, of health uh, need to incorporate into the academic experience. It allows us to partner um, and to provide our uh, budding doctors and, and nurses and pharmacists and dentists with an experience of thinking about whole patient health and how we actually help our patients, particularly those that we serve on Hospital Hill who um, have high need, uh, how to help them become healthy, so to speak. And so it goes back to the points that we were um, hearing about earlier uh, from MU and from, and from um, healthcare facilities there about um, thinking about population health. Um, we are, again, um, because we're co-located and in that area, we have in these programs um, something that impacts 3,370 students every year. Um, and again, goes beyond that with our partnerships with um, the number of beds that are available for clinical trials um, on Hospital Hill. And so just to talk you through a little bit about each one of the five projects, um, first of all, I will talk about the School of Medicine building renovation. That project um, would actually be about a $60 million project. Our School of Medicine is one of the highest numbers that we have in terms of the Facilities Condition Needs Index at 0.51 right now. Our School of Medicine um, is, uh, in many ways, needs to come up to standard of uh, new medical standards and new healthcare standards. Um, and, and uh, new teaching standards. It was built in the early 1970s, and we have only had piecemeal updates on that facility since that time. Um, and so the $60 million in, in uh, addressing this will actually cover $50 million that would be we would need to cover in deferred maintenance if we didn't do this work in this way. Um, it will improve our building systems, literally the infrastructure, the research spaces, the student spaces, and again, to get those to current standards. Um, Secondly, in this constellation, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, upgrade um, and renovations for the School of Dentistry. That is a $58.5 million project as we envision <coughs> it. Um, again, the School of Dentistry was last updated um, in any significant way 20 years ago, and that is um, a long time given that our School of Dentistry actually is a clinical site. We see 320 patients a day in our School of Dentistry providing dental care for them, and again, uh, particularly uh, for high need patients. Um, and that $58.5 million that we're looking at there um, will address approximately $24.5 million in deferred maintenance. Um, the third project that's related to this is a translational clinical research building that's a $26.5 million building as we envision it that would provide $53,000, or I'm sorry, 53,000 gross square feet of, of space on the Hospital uh, Hill campus to conduct clinical studies. Again, I mentioned that we have on Hospital Hill um, Children's Mercy and we have uh, Truman Medical Center, as w again, as well as other partners beyond Hospital Hill and uh, those non-medical health, health related um, programs that I mentioned. Um, this is where the patients and our partners are, but having space to do research, clinical studies, clinical services, and patient treatments um, gives us the ability to um, follow up and support on the about 1,500 beds that are available for clinical trials on Hospital Hill. The fourth project that we're looking at is an interprofessional education building. This is a one point, or uh, roughly a one, $100 million building, and the primary function of this 200,000 200, uh, gross square feet space would be to provide shared classrooms, meeting spaces, teaching labs, and patient simulations um, in using latest technology. And again, I emphasize that um, while we have a strong clinical uh, practice and strong teaching practice on Hospital Hill in order to move into the 21st century and take advantage of, of our core research assets um, and uh, our creditors' expectations of more interprofessional education and interprofessional work, this gives us the space to do that, as well as, and perhaps most importantly, right now or historically, we've had four different libraries in the four different buildings. We've consolidated those over time, but we need to move to a place where we can and consolidate and, and make a substantial expansion of the UMKC Health Sciences Library. That not only serves our four schools, but again, that serves the, the hospitals and the other partners that we have um, in the Health Sciences District. 
And then fifth, we have for 26.5 million, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, for 54 million, a health sciences research building. And again, the health sciences research building on Hospital Hill campus would be a collaborative research facility for basic and translational research. And the primary use of this would, to be, would be to provide adaptable laboratory space um, for wet and dry research activities and to provide core facilities and specialized research equipment and particularly around an animal facility and supporting um, not only our work and technology transfer and incubation, but uh, our partnerships. Um, just to mention for those curators who um, were not on the tour that we had earlier um, in the fall, um, as part of the work of creating a health sciences district and bringing these various partners together, um, our, our partners have come and identified five key focus areas for our research moving forward. First of all is neuroscience as it relates to addiction, um, particularly addressing the opioid epidemic, health outcomes research, which we already have um, international strength in, patient safety, which of course um, you can do well when you are uh, co-located with uh, two different kinds of hospitals and have those partnerships, and then uh, maternal fetal medicine, because as you know, with high need populations and high risk populations, it's critically important to help a mother be healthy um, as, as she is caring, and then to help um, prepare her to take care of the needs of her child. So um, we already know what some of our key focus areas are moving forward, and we look forward to working on this. I will say that you see that this is a $300 million project. You'll note that we have it all in gifts. Um, I won't speak too much to this today, but we are starting to plan for what our next development campaign will be. The University of Missouri Kansas City will be celebrating its centennial in the year 2033 and uh, 15 years out is not too soon to think about a large campaign in that regard and we would envision this to be phase one of such a campaign uh, particularly because uh, not only um, do we have some of the highest needs and it's one of our greatest priorities but we also have the opportunity um, with over 15 th um, 15 I'm going to get my number. We have a lot of alums um, from this campus who have the capacity to give. So I won't give you the exact number, but it's a significant number we can reach. I'm happy to take questions. Barb, Barb, once again, um, great job with the gifts, um, raising the funds. And this goes to your internal ranking, which I know I previously said didn't matter when it get to the, got to the board level. But for the sake of consistency, I'm looking at your scoring here. It says external funding support. This, this project is 100% funded according to your slide, but only ranked as a six score. Um, can you explain the discrepancy between that and some of the other projects that needed funding? This is a fully funded project. Why did it just get a six? Um, honestly, it's about timing. Some of this scoring happened um, in our first envisioning of this was some number of months, if not um, probably a couple years ago. And we're just moving to develop our plans for our next campaign mm -hmm. and looking at what we can do from that. So so one aspect is just kind of change. And, and also, as I signal that this is um, our, our only item that we've brought to you that is completely brand new, we are signaling this is really brand new. I can't assure you that this constellation of things will be exactly these dollars, um, and we need to build this out. We figure that we won't even start this probably for another maybe couple of years, but we want you to know that this is gonna be a big thing for us. We, and I guess we just wanna, and I guess this goes to Dave's point, because that, that was a little alarming to me to see that as ranked as a six. We have full funding for it, and I, it, it would be nice to get some consistency, well, I guess. We so, don't have any funding yeah, for it yet. Not, we have zero dollars right. today. Zero. Okay. Right. Plan so, is to raise $300 million, right. but they don't have Plan funds is. raised yet. Yeah, That's okay. why it's a lower priority. It's a right. timing issue. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Yes, we have, we have no dollars, and right. we'll be happy to take yours if you'd like to contribute some. <laughs> 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 any other questions I can answer regarding this? So the, if I'm understanding you correctly, this is, by the way, I, I learned about this yesterday. So um, it's new to me as well. Um, this is a visionary uh, uh, and, a, and a first but a large step toward really building a, a, a complex around the four disciplines, if I'm understanding this. Well, actually, in part, this is renovation as well as new. Mm -hmm. um, it is not visionary to talk about 
Um, and it's not new to talk about our needs around our School of Medicine and our School of Dentistry particularly. In fact, I think we had a study in 2010 that looked at, so seven years ago, um, we started thinking about what this constellation would be, but seven years ago, we started thinking about what we needed to do for our School of Medicine and School of Dentistry particularly. The need is growing, and um, I think um, in, in the region, and I think our understanding of the importance of health sciences related to research is growing, so it's elevated this. But I, I would say it's both a combination of new and renovation, and, and pieces and parts of this have been envisioned for at least seven years. Right. Uh, by visionary, I, I meant that it's well into the future. And when yes. you say start in a couple of years, you're talking about starting to raise the funds. You can't dig in the dirt until you've raised Right. enough funds to make it a reality. And it's a good exercise for us at this point to have it. I won't be on the board when, when you start to fill in the blanks about uh, fundraising. Um, I do agree uh, that this is a potential jewel for Kansas City and the, and the UMKC campus. We don't have a Washington University or St. Louis University uh, that, uh, that that detracts from the ability for UMKC to be a great, uh, a great university. And there are just a few opportunities, but this is one of them because you've got pharmacy, nursing, um, and, dentistry, uh, dentistry and, and of course the med school. Um, and the other point I would make is that I don't think you can get completely, particularly when it's renovation, not new building, uh, gifts. I think at some point you're probably going to look for UMKC and the university to participate. But uh, uh, in answer to Julia's earlier question, uh, part of the reason that you have funding in Kansas City is it's one of the most philanthropic communities in the country on a per capita basis. And there's a transition of wealth occurring as we speak here, older families to younger families with uh, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars who have that philanthropic uh, bent to them. Uh, so it's not unrealistic to think that this could be largely done by gifts. And um, you, in your statement to us, which we, <coughs> which we got a couple of days before now, <coughs> actually talks about the collaboration. Uh, so, so you are envisioning that this would further uh, elevate the ability for that part of our system campus to work with the, uh, with the PTMC. I will say this, that part of the plan that you've pre presented here is a translational clinical research building um, and not inexpensive. You, you really can't tell how much of that is the $300 million. Uh, I'm not going to be around when you all deal with this. but. My personal feeling would be, I'm not sure you need a building to engage in translational research if you're truly partnering with the MU TPMC. Uh, electronically, uh, you can be co-authoring articles. You can be sharing research. Right. Uh, so, so of what you've put out here, I think it's great. I do think that there will be a lot of private interest, but we don't have grateful patients in Kansas City. They're, the, uh, the patients uh, at Truman are, have no ability to, to actually make contributions. The patients at Children's Mercy and the patients, uh, parents of the patients at Children's Mercy and the patients at St. Luke's contribute to those hospitals. And because of our inadequate attention to the medical school and the health sciences, uh, Children's Mercy has moved toward KU every year. They move some of the programs away from UMKC, and it goes to KU. So I'm just sounding the alarm here that if you want to continue to lose that and that research, they do substantial research. I think one of the top five or ten uh, um, children's hospitals in the country, uh, then ignore UMKC's uh, health system. <coughs> Uh, so, so I'm excited about what you're proposing, Barbara. Mm -hmm. uh, I have reservations about another building on translational research. I think that train has left the station, and it's going to be located in MU. And uh, 
that's all I've got to say. I wish I'd be around two years from now when this moves from. You will be. I will be. Uh, You'll be here. Yeah, I will be. I'm not on this board. Uh, <laughs> I won't have this voice. So I'm using my voice. <laughs> I'm using my voice now. So, so it will move from a priority score up, and I think that the campus priority will go up as well. Th this is the opportunity of the future for UMKC. It isn't, what was it called, singing and dancing at the conservatory, although that's hugely important currently. Uh, but engineering and the medical complex and partnering with what we've got in, uh, in Columbia uh, is the future of that campus. I'm speaking as a tiger, you know, I'm not, so. speak I'm not a roo, I'm a tiger. But uh, uh, I wanted to You're make both. those points because in a couple of years, you all will be grappling with this and I hope you have the, fund the fundraising started and let's not, let's not alienate those donors in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. That's all I've got to say about that. So thank you, Barbara and I and all of the chancellors will develop programming that collaborates. We don't want to duplicate resources or facilities given the, the dearth of uh, resources that we have. So that comment is very well taken and we'll put that to practice. And if I could just finish with a couple of uh, follow-up comments uh, for you to understand the concept. Um, first of all, I recognize that it's nascent. Um, and, uh, and when I said, you know, we don't have a dollar yet, it, it's because you really are getting this. We wanted to codify this. One reason we wanted to do that is not only because we do want to signal our opportunities and our willingness to collaborate with MU, but we also want to take that point that Curator Phillips made, which is um, there are things happening in Kansas City um, around competitiveness in the healthcare space, and we need to signal that we are moving forward to be um, as up to date as we can. Um, there are conversations around other schools of dentistry, and there are conversations around um, strengthening um, uh, for profit and other institutions, medical programs. So, so we need to signal that we are going to be. Um, present and working. I'd also say um, we do, I just remind people, have a very unique medical program in the fact that we have a six-year medical degree, which allows us to draw some of the best and brightest from across the nation and to our program. And to that end, um, when we talk about gifts and that $300 million, I do want to make clear that we, uh, to, to Curator Phillips' point, we certainly have a wonderful community in Kansas City um, that, that supports uh, UMKC, but our alumni are around the world, um, from the School of Medicine particularly. We have strong pockets um, and people who are leaders in healthcare um, with the military and with the federal government and in um, organizations such as um, the National Institutes of Health and in private practice and in governing boards. Um, and it has a lot to do with the fact that they got a little bit of a leg up being in a six-year med program. So we have strong pockets in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., um, as well as in St. Louis and just across <laughs> the state so our alumni are, are certainly ready and willing for a visionary idea to step up and give in this if there are no other questions I would ask for a motion and a second from the Finance Committee to approve the further planning and development of the <coughs> University of Missouri Kansas City projects presented today and as outlined in the board materials provided to you as part of UMKC preliminary five-year capital plan so moved second Cindy curator Bernsick yes Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sunvold? Yes. Is there a motion from the board? No. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Now, let me make it clear. I'm, we, we have a hard break at 1 o'clock. Now, my goal is to get done if we can, but having said that, I believe that this is an important meeting, that this is curator business, and maybe going forward we can we can avoid these sort of... Uh, Let me tell you what the, uh, the plan is. The plan is take a very brief uh, break right now. Uh, the box lunches for the board, for the general officers, for the chancellors are back here. Cindy, is that right? Next door. If, uh, right next door. If everyone could grab their box lunch, come back, uh, we're going we're gonna to proceed. We'd but making it clear, if we're not done and the board thinks they have unfinished business, you, we will break and, and We'll come break back. and we'll come back and finish yeah. our business. That's exactly right. I'm going to try to get right. done, but yeah. Uh, I, I can explain to you that at the unveiling of the, uh, the uh, statue for, for Norm, they have special seating for us, and it would be very conspicuous if we're not there. Let's go. Let's take our break and get our box lunches.
Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could just say something pretty quickly. You may. We're going to change the order a little bit and go to UMSL. I want all of you to know that, that uh, Chancellor Maples has very graciously agreed to move to the back because he thinks he can be uh, shorter. Uh, and of course, that brevity showing we did the right thing in just uh, uh, making that extension of his appointment. So uh, I'll go, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, we'll have uh, Chancellor Tom George now present the UMSL plan. Welcome, Tom. Well, thank you very much, Board of Curators, President Choi, colleagues, Chancellors, especially Chancellor Maples for letting me move in front of him on this. Uh, I was told I didn't have to rush too much, but I will try to be as uh, to the point as possible. Would you tell us who said that? <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What I want to do is, this will be just a little different than what you've uh, seen with the other three presentations, is I'd like to give you a context for what I'm going to be proposing, because what I'm going to be proposing doesn't, is, has no whiz-bang stuff. It's not an excited new building. It's not this and that that you've heard of up to this point. It's stuff that goes inside the walls. It's stuff that is a maintenance and repair renovation, critical for our campus, but I want to give you the context of why I'm proposing that. We just got off the biggest capital building spree of the history of the university. We started from scratch. In 1963, we were a country club, a golf course, and a lot of building took place in the 1960s. And while we're the youngest campus in terms of age, you know, 53, 54 years old, we're also the oldest campus in terms of buildings. And we also inherited a number of buildings from the Catholic Church and then buildings that are all built in the 1960s. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of renovating the campus. Uh, we probably, it's fair to say, have excess space. Uh, we don't, we have a lot of room to grow and a lot of room to eliminate, and I'll touch base on that. But let me just touch base on some of the buildings we just completed in the last two to three years. One is the Science Learning Building. That's a building that is about to the tune of $32 million. And um, that particular building is sorely needed. It's in, within the oldest complex that we have on the campus. It boards right on Natural Bridge Road, which cuts right through the middle of the campus. And that building, I, we are, we're, I think we're about as creative as you can be with funding. Uh, that particular building we took out of our hide. It's $2 million a year with bond payments for 30 years and we just took that out of our operating costs. Now you can argue those are state dollars, but they're, it's not newly appropriated state dollars, so we would say this is not state funds, this is our own operating budget. Great building, and in fact, you, with the new curators and their orientation next month are gonna be able to see this building. We just completed a wellness, wellness, recreation wellness center. The first question prospective freshmen have when they come to the campus is show us your recreation center. Well, we've got one now. It was a student referendum, so this is all paid by student fees. And actually, they had a, a fee of $19.25 per credit hour that they voted for, and we were able to get a lower cost to the building when we went out for bid. So the building, instead of being $36 million, is $33 million, 100,000 square feet, totally student funded. So that's one type of funding. Now we also have an UMSL patient care center. All this just recently completed. The patient care center is part of the College of Optometry. It's $17 million. With that, we squirreled away tuition dollars of $5 million. They're the only college that keeps their own tuition, and they have been doing this, building up this, if called a nest egg for this purpose. The students themselves voted a fee increase to help fund this, and some of you curators were at the meeting when we approved that, you approved that. And then also we've, we've, we've gotten the cost down to about 12 million, didn't fund a few positions, bonding 12 million. It's now complete, and we took about a third of the space and moved it aside to partner with SSM, which is a major healthcare provider in the St. Louis region. We do general practice there, we do OBGYN and diagnostics. Then we have Anheuser-Busch Hall, that just opened. And that's a business administration building. We raised $10 million of private funds uh, from individuals and corporations in the area and got matching from the state. There weren't too many state matches and we managed to squeeze in under the wire and get the $10 million state match. Then we have the Great Streets Initiative funded by the Missouri Department of Transportation that cuts right through the center of the campus. 
And finally, Benton Hall renovation. That's in the science complex, a $25 million project, partly funded by the state, partly funded by our own budgets out of UMSL, and partly funded by the system. I should point out that the only two projects which have state funding here is the Benton Hall, the renovation, and also um, the uh, Anheuser-Busch Hall. That's it. Everything else has been funded by different means. But anyway, this is, a, you know, we've had a total facelift of the campus now. And again, new curators will get a chance to tour some of this. So having given that as a, as a backdrop, let me go into now our proposal. And we have four or five projects, actually. Space consolidation infrastructure, social science, let's bring this up, social science, um, building renovation, Stadler Hall renovation, college and nursing simulation, training facilities, and South Campus power distribution. Let me talk now about the space consolidation and infrastructure. We're proposing $8 million of university funds, and when I say university funds, what I mean is probably some combination of dollars allocated through the system office and through the University of Missouri-St. Louis. That's the way we're doing the renovation of Benton Sadler. I don't have that division. Maybe Ryan has some thoughts on that division, but it'd be a, some division between the two. The state request we're suggesting for this is $8 million. And what we want to do with this is take social work out out of what's called Bell Reeve Hall, which is on the edge of, of the South Campus, and move them into Marillac Hall. And these are maybe just names to you, but this is a, a, a way of taking a building which is Bell Reeve Hall. It really <coughs> is outlived its usefulness, and then we would demolish it. We've done that before. For example, we bought an osteopathic hospital on Natural Bridge Road, and we demolished that and then that made space for the new optometry patient care center. And that would also lower our FCNI index. It would reduce, it would actually eliminate $22 million from our facilities condition needs. And that's kind of a driver in a lot of what we're doing. We have, the campus has driven up to, at one point was up to 0.39. Higher is bad with FCNI, lower is better, and we want to get ourselves down as a campus as close to 0.3 or even less as possible. And this would also reduce operating costs by, you know, about uh, half a million dollars. Uh, this would also take the College of Education and move them from some administrative offices they're at into Marillac Hall. Marillac Hall has been vacated by optometry going into the new patient care center. And then also we have a standalone building for music inherited from the Catholic Church and we would move music over to the J.C. Penney building and then eventually take down the music building. A lot of what we're talking about now is taking buildings down. Getting the signal from the president, move on, okay. Uh, let's go to the social sciences building renovation. Uh, here we're proposing university funds of nearly $8 million, a state request of a million dollars. And what this would do is a social science complex. It's got, as you would guess, social sciences departments. Also has the tower. And you can see the tower there and also the social science uh, departments. Um, what we, we would do there is provide more state-of-the-art classrooms. We have several already, which are very well used. And we want to now add some more to that, to that enterprise. Stadler Hall renovation. In the science complex, we have the new science learning building. We have Benton Hall, that, which is undergoing renovation right now. We have a research building. <laughs> then we have Stadler Hall, largely occupied by biology and biochemistry. And what we would like to do is renovate about 82,000 square feet of this, again, providing state-of-the-art in terms of laboratory facilities like we've got in the new science learning building. And this would knock off $26 million from our facilities condition needs. I should mention that I think system-wide, uh, there's about, in terms of M&R needs, about $1.5 billion. We're about $350 million of that. So we're methodically looking at how we could whittle down on, uh, on knocking down their, our maintenance and repair needs. Then we have South Campus power distribution upgrades. Uh, on the South Campus, we get our power from utility poles. On the North Campus, we have our own substation. What we're proposing here now is to get a substation on the South Campus. It will be less expensive for us than to operate the South Camp, the substation on the South, on the South Campus. Uh, we, we, our bills are made to Ameren, and but this is this will be something that's really more efficient. And so that's uh, that university funds. This is not a state request, 
and we're, we're trying to identify $9 million of university funds. The last item I have is the College of Nursing. And the College of Nursing has, uh, we've not, we've now have, what we're, we're, what we're not taking to you is our dream. That's sometime in the future. That first building we have for optometry, $17 million, it's part of a larger dream of a $90 million complex, which would include nursing. We're not bringing that to you now, but what we're trying to do is take care of nursing in the existing facilities. And we have particularly a lot of needs with terms of simulations uh, to become state of the art. We've got the second largest nursing program in the St. Louis region. We do compete with other nursing programs. There's eight nursing schools in the St. Louis region, so there's a lot of competition in the nursing region. But we've got an outstanding nursing program, and so we would like to renovate the space that we already have for nursing. So again, the new building is sometime in the future but renovation so everything I'm presenting here in terms of our proposal is maintenance repair renovation it's not whiz bang it doesn't have the same excitement ring I guess as uh, seeing a new building but the point is we just got done 150 million dollars of new buildings so that's my that's my presentation any questions yeah. or discussion I'm, I'm just curious as to why there's zero dollars allocated for gifts and all the other categories uh, for for nursing? No, that's the only one that has any gifts allocated to it. Uh, the other projects had zero. I was I, just wondering if you yeah. had any. Well, uh, we just finished with gifts on the business administration building, and we're now raising more gift dollars for that. We that that's part of a forty-five million dollar project, and we're we're on our way to doing another ten million dollars for that. I just didn't put it here because okay. it's not a priority. But no, we we do raise gift monies. We not quite the the level that uh, UMKC has been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is admirable, right? But um, I just think um, that for gate B, I know that um, I will be asking what the plan is um, to raise money for any of these projects independent of um, state requests. Yeah. The reason we went, let me just comment on that, particularly with respect to the science learning building. We did a feasibility study about five years ago for the science learning building, and it came back very negatively in terms of the St. Louis community being willing to give monies for renovation and things of this sort. So uh, the Benton Hall, which we're renovating, we, we just by the feasibility study couldn't get private dollars. It doesn't mean now we can start again and try to do that again. Uh, but you know, it, it, it's renovation in NMR is, is very difficult to raise gifts for. You get a dollar. Hmm? You get a couple dollars. Yeah. But your, your point's well taken. We'll continue to try to do that. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Can you go this, back question. to the substation? Please? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did. Here's a substation, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, is that? My understanding, and let me try to do the answer, and then maybe I'll, I'll defer to Larry Eisenberg, who is. Trying to figure out like, how soon that'll pay for itself, basically. Oh, well, Larry, maybe you can respond. How much would it pay for itself? <laughs> We, we don't really you know, we don't really have a payback schedule for that right now. It it uh, I don't know. <coughs> going to yeah, we have a problem on South Campus with the reliability of the power, uh, but by um, adding the new substation, we will get a lower rate on the utility. So it, it will eventually, I guess, pay for itself. It, it will lower the rates, but, but it's really more about reliability than anything else, I think. There's not an easier, cheaper way to do that? I mean, I, I guess I, that's what I was trying to understand. Than a substation? Yeah. That, uh, well, I mean, we have a substation on the north campus, which already gives us lower rates, and so we're trying to piggyback on that. My understanding, too, is, is if you get enough things together, you get a lower rate as well. So having two substations would get us an even lower rate. I mean, if we could come back, if you want, with a plan of... I wasn't how expecting to see this, and oh. so <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in it, you know, yeah. thinking that you know, it, it might be a really good idea. I yeah. just it's not to... a top priority for us. Right, right, right. Yeah. We did do a planning study back in 2010, and this was their recommendation for the most efficient way to improve the reliability of the power to South Campus. This is also part of um, really what we call the master plan, and I just want to emphasize that <coughs> all the campuses have a master plan. We have a consultant, Sazaki, out of Boston, and so this is all tied in with the master plan. 
then this is part of ultimately the master plan, which ties in with the capital planning. All the buildings we just finished that I mentioned earlier were all part of the, of the long-term master plan. And we're going through an update of the master plan now. About every three years, we update the master plan. Any other discussion? Focusing on the, the social science building, which is really a renovation, it seems like, right? Yes, a renovation and uh, an upgrading. I mean, I think when we talk about having more state-of-the-art classrooms, we've, we've put a few in there, high-tech classrooms, very popular. doesn't matter what the discipline. And so we'd like to get a lot more of those. And, and I think you said that you've had some overbuilding. I'm looking at the disciplines that are housed in the social science building. And it doesn't, uh, first of all, it doesn't require much lab work. No, no. Um, there's no lab, there's no hard laboratories except computer labs. And there's not necessarily synergism between the, uh, the disciplines that are housed there. Is there any possibility? So I'm always looking at projects to think, do we need more, uh, do, do we need even our current amount of classroom space? Uh, because the shift toward distance learning um, and, and blending that, should we be spending more on IT, either at the campus or more likely at the system level? And this may be a building that if it costs 30, uh, almost $40 million to Re to uh, to renovate it, uh, are there spaces where those disciplines could be placed in other current classrooms and not have to renovate an old building, which costs more? Um, it, it is, is that something you've thought through? And 10 years from now, are we going to be looking to, to let go of more classroom space? Um, so I, I'm just raising that as an issue. Is, yeah, no, very is that good, where the money should question. be spent? Well, let me talk about that a little. Um, well, first of all, what we're, what we're proposing to do here in the social sciences is going to enhance online learning. I mean, we're talking about having more high-tech classrooms. And a lot of what we're doing in our planning is taking buildings down. We're not adding space. We're taking space down. So I mentioned social work moving out of bear, of. Uh, uh, Bell Reeve Hall, we're going to take that building down then. Music moving out, we're going to take that building down. And there, we're even p picking up online learning and music disciplines as well. So uh, what this is would be doing is really enhancing our online experience. Uh, it's, the building exists. And so I think you know, it's, it's difficult to talk about that tower and taking the tower down. So we're trying to look for efficient ways of using it. So all of this that we're proposing here is, is going to enhance the online learning possibilities. We have a new program called Now Stand. Just we just launched it. It's night, online, and weekends, and that's that's looking for trying to convert spaces around campus into more high tech so, spaces. So, Tom, when this comes back for Gate B, you will provide what you'll provide for us the classroom usage of existing yes. classroom. Yeah. Right. And so that uh, this doesn't duplicate what you currently have. Right. And if there is no further discussion, may I have a motion <coughs> to, committee to approve the further planning and development of the University of Missouri St. Louis projects presented today and is outlined in the board materials as part of the UMSL preliminary five year capital plan. So moved. Second. Curator Brunsick? Yes. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sunbold? Yes. All votes in favor. Thank you. Now, we need an agile chancellor to <laughs> skip up to the podium. <laughs> in all seriousness, while you're approaching, uh, Chancellor Maples has been very gracious in, in, in moving, and, and we're going to try, but, but it doesn't mean anybody should cut their questions short to get done so we don't have to come back. Go ahead, Chancellor. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I will be as brief as possible. Um, by way of setup here, we're going to be looking at uh, five items eventually. Whoop. I have to go back the other oh, way. Oh, I messed you up, didn't I? Oh, we're good. <clears throat> we will be looking at five items here. Um, just so you know a little bit about our process, this, uh, these are five of 17 total that we have looked at and gone. 
you're not going to see them unless we have the ability to try to move forward with them and that there's a real need. And so we do a lot of, of screening ahead of time before you get to, you know, you get a chance to weigh in on this uh, because this is, these are really our campus priorities. Um, those 17 are rated generally on impact timing, which is also an important aspect of all this, and then whether or not they're fitting in with our strategic and master plans and what that impact is. Um, in addition, we have student representation on all of our programming efforts for each project. And so let me go through each of these quickly. Um, what you see here is shrink hall addition and renovation. This is basically a South Campus and a biosciences complex. So this is phase three. Um, 30 million has already been invested by S&T and by donors. Uh, this is a renovate and replace. And I will tell you that given the uh, STEM aspects of what our campus does and that focus on it, we have almost every single student on our campus that goes through that building at least once, with at least one class. And there are a number of them that go through. Um, there's a lot of research space and support for faculty and graduate research, and, and that's an important aspect too. You will, the board will recall in uh, previous presentations from President Choi and others, that our university is one of the ones that has actually increased the number of faculty over the past few years. Those faculty need the space now to conduct their research and to get their research projects off and running. There's also been an <coughs> emphasis on trying to increase our research and increase our graduate footprint. This is the next step in order to have that help for our faculty and to increase those areas. Um, this fits absolutely squarely in the center of both our facilities master plan and our campus strategic plan. And uh, I will not go through and tell you all about the pieces of this. You have it in front of you. Um, and as I say, this is phase three. Uh, we are requesting, uh, there's a $54 million request that we have for this, which is basically 56% of the total budget. Our second priority, and this is one that's for 20, and this is one that's for 2018. The shrink call is for a 2019. So this one is now. This one is this fiscal year, um, and this is our advanced construction and materials laboratory. <coughs> and by way of background, uh, the board will probably recall that this was on the 50-50 match before the state uh, politely declined to to come up with their 50%. Um, and so uh, in working with President Choi in the system office and with our new dean of engineering coming in the door, uh, the university and the president decided to split the remaining 50% between the two of us so that we are taking care of all of this between the two of us. And so what that means is that um, S&T's contribution to this total cost of six, six million is a little under five million. Um, when it's, when it's all said and done, and the rest of it will be coming from uh, the system office. This is new construction as an addition. This is high base space. This is very much, again, squarely in the university strategic plan and facilities master plan. This one is especially relevant with regard to growth in, uh, in the graduate programs and research, especially given the support for in infrastructure, uh, transportation kinds of things, construction <coughs> kinds of things. And infrastructure in the U.S. is a really critical need just generally. And in Missouri, it's particularly critical. Um, as we've heard many places, there are a lot of roads and a lot of terrible shape. And this is one of the areas that, that we have um, university transportation projects. We have centers working on this. And this will help advance those kinds of, of projects. Can I? Yes, sir. Could you go back to that just very And the yes, reason sir. is I wanted the board to understand that this is a project, if you look at your uh, uh, materials, that's FY18. Uh, 18. 18. This 18. is one of the projects we discussed is specifically grandfathered in. Yes, and, and while this is, a, we call this gate A, he's proceeding, uh, the proceeding directly to uh, project approval. Probably when, Ryan? The December meeting. And so, and, and, and the chancellor and I had talked about this, so he understands, I think, that I was going to do this. If there are any questions on this, I think that it is important uh, to ask them now because this is farther along than many of the projects that we've seen today. We're really 
while we're at a preliminary capital improvement, this is grandfather and enters proceeding directly to approval. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions or discussion on this? <coughs> if, if I could just say one thing, probably it is the cheapest research space that we can build in the entire four campus university area. It is uh, locked and loaded for advanced materials. Uh, we have a new uh, institute, the Transportation Institute at MSNT, and this is really amazingly inexpensive research space. And, and it's, it'll be able to house large equipment. It's that high base space that is really hard to come by uh, in a lot of places, and often is far more expensive. Thank, thank you, Curtis Steelman. I appreciate that. Um, our engineering research laboratory addition and renovation, and what I would point out to you here <coughs> is that as you see the, uh, the, the three sort of odd square looking shapes, we're talking about adding the larger of the three in order to basically connect a couple of buildings together. And, and this is really for 2020 is where we would be heading with this one. Um, this is really s and premier research complex, ultimately. Um, it's a very interdisciplinary research space. We have a lot of plans for centers and how our centers work and how our research centers work, where we're going to incentivize them to do some inter more interdisciplinary research, start giving them some timelines to be self-sufficient, have them roll in, have them roll out, and really try to incentivize that whole entrepreneurial, find those really cool places at the interstices of, of silos, uh, where silo discipline is. And this would be research space for several of these centers. Um, there would be, in addition to this interdisciplinary research, a lot of graduate student and postdoctoral education that would be going on here. And again, this would be moving the needle dramatically for research. It is, again, squarely in our strategic plan and our facilities master plan. And by connecting these buildings, it really provides an opportunity to connect people together, um, which is really, really critical and really important for these kinds of projects. I have a process question at this point. Certainly. <laughs> so this one uh, looks like it doesn't require state funding. Um, it's a priority for the first one that we saw does require state funding. It's a priority one. Um, how, do, how, how does the process work since the campus has prioritized one that requires 30 $43 million in state funding, and we have one that's kind of like low-hanging <coughs> fruit. Doesn't require any state funding. I'll let Chris answer that, although I do have a good idea. I will say, Shrink is, in many ways, the hub of the academic mission of uh, MSNT and is, is direly in need of renovation, so I think that that is much of what's driven them, but go ahead. I, I would say that that's a really good answer. The priority is the need that we have on the campus, the need to advance our mission and advance our strategic <coughs> plan and the need to fit within the facilities master plan. And while funding is really important on that, um, the funding is what dictates some of the timing and us being able to do some of these things as well. And by, by way of history, um, in the past 20 years, um, s and has received approximately $27 million in state funding for all the capital projects that we have done in the past 20 years. And nothing beyond Shrink Hall that you're going to see here requests any state funding. Thanks. The library uh, learning commons renovation is also uh, uh, is slated for farther out. This is roughly 2021. Uh, this will really focus on student success and how students use study space, study materials, and study time. There'll be shared space, meeting space, learning space, uh, help space, design creation space. Um, this is a renovation in addition. Um, I happen to live on a campus where some of the most, the most interesting student comments I get back are, can we, can we keep the learning center open 24 hours? Because we really like studying there. Um, it's that kind of a place. And, and I will tell you now, having run a kind of experiment with new study facilities in a new building at Oregon Tech before coming here, we took exactly the same classes, exactly the same faculty, exactly the same students. 
moved them out of really shabby spaces scattered around the Portland metro area into a new space and there was almost a 0.5 GPA increase just because students wanted to stay there and study together and work together. It's pretty amazing how that works. And then the last thing you'll see on the list is the Havener Center renovation and expansion. That's for 2022. Uh, this is our student center. It really has become the center of campus life for so many things. Not only is it a student center, but there's also uh, a lot of uh, food court type of uh, businesses in there. There are meeting rooms for students, for faculty, for staff, for the rest of the university. Parts of this town use it for various meeting spaces and events that, that they do in Rolla as well. This is a, a new construction renovation um, and, and really it, it is a focal point for the campus and a gateway to our university. And so um, this one is on the, on the list for 2022 moving forward. I told you I'd be quick. And, and thank you. Any, <laughs> any discussion or questions for? For, so uh, you have a fair amount to read already with what we've got. If there is no uh, further discussion, may I have a motion and a second from the Finance Committee uh, to approve the further planning and development of the Missouri University of Science and Technology projects presented today and as outlined in the board materials provided to you as part of the MS&T preliminary five-year capital plan. So moved. Cindy. Curator Burnsick? Yes. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sunbold? Yes. Okay. All votes in favor. If, if I can say one final thing, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to say again how much I appreciate the work that uh, Ryan and and their team and Rick, because I'm, I'm leaving out people, Eric, uh, Barb, er, there have been a lot of work put into this. I, I, I hope the curators recognize that staff really made an effort to, to do this in the right way. That doesn't mean it's perfect. I uh, also wanted to say I thank you to the curators because this is an extra meeting that we're biting off. And I hope that the public and, and the administration and faculty and staff understand that the curators have been willing to give of their time to do this very important uh, project and, and uh, go through this material. I would invite each of you to think about what is good and what is bad about this process. You can email Ryan. I've just volunteered you, or me, or Marcy, or every, anybody else, because I, I think there are some tweaks that will be needed going forward, and now while it's fresh in your mind, if you can think of them, we ought to start thinking further. Yeah, on behalf of the board, I want to express our appreciation <coughs> to uh, David, the Finance Committee, and, and Jeff, to the uh, Compensation and HR Committee for uh, working hard to get this ready for today. And I know that many board members and also chancellors and general officers uh, made arrangements on fairly short notice to be here today for this meeting, and, and we all appreciate that. It was a very important meeting. Uh, it's a meeting that I'm, I'm proud of, and I know we all are, and it, it, uh, it moves us uh, into the future in, a, in an enlightened and uh, prepared way. Uh, is there any further business before the board? You in, uh, on the agenda that there's a possibility of an exec executive session, there is no matter for our executive session, so we will not go into executive session. And if there is no further business, uh, the board or the, bo the chair would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Cindy, will you call the roll? Curator Burnsick? Yes. Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Curator Sunbold? Yes. Meeting's adjourned. Jamie, thank you for uh, staying with us the entire time. Appreciate it. <laughs>